a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars Death Star by Michael Reeves and Steve Perry. Copyright 2007 by Lucasfilm Limited. Read by Christopher Hurt. 26. Deck 92, Sector N1, Death Star. Ratua didn't have any connection to religion. He didn't subscribe to any of the doctrines or dogmas, more than a few of which he had been exposed to in his life. However, if there was one that promised a thieves' paradise, it might not be too different from this battle station. He'd been afraid at first that he'd have to skulk about the outlying corridors and hallways, staying in the shadows, taking service tubes and stairs to avoid being stopped by station security. But he had walked past guards scores of times, hesitantly at first, then with less worry, and finally with nothing but confidence. As far as he could tell, nobody had even lifted an eyebrow in his direction. Nobody stopped him and asked him what business he was on. Nobody asked for identification as long as he stayed away from corridors and chambers plainly marked off limits to unauthorized personnel. In short, nobody seemed to notice him at all. The prevailing attitude seemed to be that if you were here on the station, then you must belong here. And as long as you weren't doing something that looked suspicious, you were free to come and go as you liked. Ratua wasn't quite to the point where he swaggered about as if he owned the place. But he did move now with a certain confidence that belied his true status, and which no doubt made him even more invisible to the cools. He strolled into the public cafeterias, selected food and drink, and ate unmolested. No ID was necessary for that. Food was free. He'd even slipped into a supply depot, and using his speedy mode, had borrowed fresh clothes, a basic freight handler's coveralls. The first few days he had been on the station, he'd found a few empty trash chutes that didn't seem to be used, where a clever being could rig a couple of cross-piece supports and camp out of sight. Of course, you had to be careful that somebody didn't open the chute and dump trash onto your impromptu bivouac, but that had only happened once. Still, it had been sufficiently discomforting to send him looking for more congenial hiding places. That, and the suspicion gleaned from sounds and smells that there were things living on the garbage levels, big things. After that, he found all manner of storage spaces that were empty or nearly so, and for a being with his skills, slipping into these when nobody was around was child's play. He could sleep there without much worry at all. Food, shelter, clothes, he had all the basics. And after he had gotten the lay of the place, some artful scavenging had provided basic items for barter. Ho, trooper, you know anybody who might have use for a D9 battery pack in pretty good condition? As it happens, I have one, and find myself a little short of coin until payday. Worth ten C's easy, but I can let you have it for seven. Within a week, he had a pretty good stash of trade goods, hidden in a recycling station storage bin. Enough credits to buy small items he couldn't get for free, or borrow, and aligned to a couple of quartermasters who were making a little extra in the gray and black markets. No matter where you went people were the same. There were honest ones, dishonest ones, generous, greedy, all across the spectrum. And if you were paying attention, you could tell which were which and use them to your benefit. If he had learned nothing else living on a prison planet, he had learned to pay attention. By creating a false identity tab, he became Tay Roxor, an inspector employed by a civilian contractor who built storage bins for recycling stations, which gave him a reason to be in such places. Not that it seemed necessary. The one time a guard had seen him going boldly into one of his storage spaces, Ratua had just smiled and nodded at him, and the guide waved back and gone on about his business. Unbelievable. Give him a year like this, he'd be running this battle station. 27. Rec Room 17A, Level 36, Death Star. Lieutenant Vildance looked around the interior of the rec room. 
It was of basic design, tall ceiling, mirrors along one wall, an expanse of padded floor, and otherwise empty save for seven or eight people, all of them humans, but one, a tall Rodian with a vibroblade scar across his face. Didn't see a lot of them in the military. Didn't see many aliens at all, given how generally xenophobic the Empire was. But Vil had heard that some of them were pretty good bounty hunters. Given that, he could understand why the Rodian might be here. It helped explain the face scar as well. Vil checked his chrono. Class was supposed to start in five minutes. Most of the others looked to be in pretty good shape, which wasn't unexpected. Not a lot of do-little types would bother to stir their backsides to come and try something that required any physical effort. He knew plenty of pilots who, outside of the required calisthenics, got most of their exercise from walking to the cooler to get another bottle of ale. Vil kept in pretty fair shape on his own. He wasn't here so much for the workout, or even the knowledge, as he was for the possibility that he might gain a tiny edge as a pilot. At the academy, somebody had done some research and found that people who studied this kind of thing had slightly better scores in the flight simulators due to decreased reaction time. He'd never really had a chance to try it before. He was, he knew, already an excellent pilot. But every little bit he could add to that was worth checking into. The door slid open. A man in gray workout skins walked into the room. He had a rolling, muscular gait and a big smile and appeared to be in his early thirties. He wasn't particularly big or impressively muscled, but something about the way he moved, the economy of his motion, said to Vil that this guy knew his stuff. I'm Sergeant Nova Steele, he said, and I'd guess that almost everybody here outranks me. But let's get this straight from the start. I don't care if you're a gasser or an admiral. This is my class. What we're talking about is Terras Cassie, a martial art designed for close work. Hands, feet, elbows, knives, sticks. I expect I know more about this stuff than any of you, so what I say goes. You can't live with that? Walk now. Unless, of course, somebody can demonstrate they are better than I am, in which case I'll take lessons from you. He paused. So do we have any fighters here? Vil felt he could handle himself reasonably well when the furniture started flying, but there was no way he was going to step up to that kind of comment. It wasn't the sort of invitation anyone in his right mind would extend unless he was reasonably confident of what the end result would be. He looked around. A couple of the men looked to be ground pounders, thick, with enough muscle to be dangerous. There was one guy, a little smaller than most, who had a feral gleam in his eyes. Vil's impression was that he wouldn't want to have the guy behind him in a dark corridor. And there was the Rodian, but he didn't know enough about Rodians to judge that one. One of the men he'd pegged as ground pounders said, I can handle myself okay. Steele gave him a welcoming grin. The ground pounder was taller, heavier, and he did look like a man you wouldn't want mad at you. Vil had the feeling, however, that that wasn't going to make a whole lot of difference to Sergeant Steele. Okay, the instructor said. Come and show me something. Knock me down and I'll buy your drinks for the next month. The ground pounder grinned at that. Coming right up, Sarge. Vil thought, this'll be interesting. And before his mind could finish the thought, it was over. The big ground pounder stepped in, swung a punch that would have dented quadanium plate, and a second later was lying flat on his face. Vil didn't have a clue what the sergeant had done to cause it. He'd just made some kind of fast sidestep and what looked like a wave of his hands, and bam, the attacker hit the floor hard enough that Vil could feel it vibrate. Ouch. There was a surprised murmur from the others that indicated they didn't know what Steele had done either. Bet the class is a lot bigger once this gets around, Vil thought. Anybody else want to give it a shot? Much shuffling of feet, inspection of fingernails, and sudden interest in the ceiling. Nobody did, apparently. Good. Steele reached one hand down and helped the ground pounder to his feet. Then let's get started. Med Center, Death Star. Because there weren't enough medical doctors or droids to go around, Yuli found himself, somewhat to his annoyance, doing routine physical exams on new arrivals to the station. Using a surgeon for such work was rather like using a protocol droid to run a water converter, 
The task would be accomplished speedily and efficiently, but it would definitely not be the most effective use of the droid's time and skill. He gave the diagnostic printout of the just-finished scan a look over while his latest patient got dressed. The man was human, originally from Corellia, but he'd been eking out a grim existence on despair for the last four months. Nowhere on his dossier did it list the reason he'd been banished to that pest hole. Why should it? No point in wasting pixels on a man who, for all intents and purposes, was dead. The stats were unsurprising. Elevated urinary nitrogen, compromised immune system, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, incipient scurvy, borderline malnutrition, in short. The man was lean as a given, with no excess fat at all to soften sinew and musculature. He'd been able to survive, but if he hadn't been scooped up in one of the regular sweeps for more workers, he wouldn't have lasted much longer. Now his problems were over, for the short run at least. No more subsisting on boiled knobbly pears and roasted rat bats. The mass-produced rations that were the workers' diet might not be particularly tasty, but they would be nutritious enough to keep him alive and laboring for the empire. Until he was most likely worked to death. After the Corellian had been led out by a med droid, Yuli rubbed his eyes and asked, Who's up next? Seformio said, Mima Ruthus, female, Ruti and Twi'lek Ryloth, arrived on station nine days past from Imperial Center. Coruscant, Yuli corrected the droid. I always hated that name change. He glanced at the wall chrono. Nearly 1145 hours. He'd been on his feet since 2300. Mima Ruthus is a civilian contractor whose designation is RSW-6, subgrade 2, miscellaneous entertainment and services. Which means what? She was hired to run a cantina in this sector. Yuli couldn't help but feel slightly peeved at the droid. Why didn't you just say that in the first place? I did, Captain Dr. Davini. If you had studied your Imperial designation manual, you could hardly have reached any other conclusion. I don't need a droid telling me to read the manual, thank you very much. Seformio made a snorting sound. What was that? Condensation on my vocabulator. It needed to be cleared. Yuli grinned and shook his head. Give me the chart. In the exam room, the Twi'lek female sat on the table in a disposable wrap, dangling her bare feet over the edge. Her skin tone was teal, and at first glance, she certainly looked healthy enough. Mima Ruthis, I'm Dr. Davini. Doctor? A cool and noncommittal acknowledgement. He looked at the flat screen. Says here that you're originally from Ryloth, by way of Coruscant. By way of a lot of places. No major illnesses or injury on the record? Nope. I had cavern fever as a child. I'm from the dark side, but that was common enough. Most of the younglings caught that sooner or later. Other than that, nothing to speak of. Yuli nodded. It had been a long time since his medical rotations, and he'd never seen that many Twi'leks even then, though he had cut open a few since. Her chart indicated pretty standard stuff. He'd test her reflexes, listen to her heart, and then let the diagnoster check the rest, including a broad scan for any possible pan-species communicable diseases. Not that it mattered much, since she'd already been here for a week and a half. Everything by the numbers. Any third-year medical student could do it. He turned to the instrument table and fitted an osculator to his ears, then turned back to her, saying, Well, let's have a listen to your heart. Would you mind? He stopped as she slid off the table, shucked her wrap, and tossed it onto the table all in a single smooth motion. Then she faced him. Yuli wore his professional expression. I was going to say... Would you mind taking a deep breath? She shrugged. You would have gotten around to asking eventually. Yuli wasn't sure in what context her remark was meant, and not in a big hurry to find out. Ruthus was definitely an attractive female, no two ways about it. Still, he was a doctor. He'd seen more than a few beings of various sexes naked before. It was all part of the job. He poked and listened and examined, didn't find anything remarkable, and noted such on the flat-screen chart. She was a well-nourished, well-developed, sthenic, Twi'lek female, who looked a bit younger than her stated age, 
and was within normal limits for a being of her species, at least according to the old-fashioned physical exam. Step in front of the diagnostic, please. She did so. The machine hummed as it sensed her presence on the exam pad. A bright light flashed, and in an instant she was weighed and measured, her various bodily systems, digestive, respiratory, nervous, circulatory, and musculoskeletal, scanned. The machine ran a battery of more than a hundred tests in a heartbeat, both generic and species-specific, and sent the results to his flat screen. They testified that Mima Ruthis was normal, healthy, and disease-free. No surprises. You can get dressed, he told her. She looked at him. So I pass? Yes, everything checks out fine. Two hours of my life I'll never get back, she muttered as she began to redress. Yuli left the room, suppressing a smile. He knew just how she felt. 28. Central Command Deck, Overbridge, Death Star. Tarkin found himself wishing once again that Dalo were here. It surprised him how much he missed her company. She had military responsibilities at the Maw installation, of course. But the truth was that the nature of that area of space in which a congeries of black holes orbited one another in an elegant, complicated dance, made casual passers-by unlikely in the extreme. And if that weren't enough, the four star destroyers on duty there were more than capable of discouraging any errant ships, rebel or otherwise. And now that the station was being constructed here in the Horus system, the importance of the work at the mall was somewhat less than it had been. It was true that Quixux's other projects, the Sun Crusher, the World Devastators, and other potent superweapons were still in development there, as well as the installation being full of valuable scientists and technicians. But if Daler were to leave for a week or two, there would be no problem whatsoever with her captains maintaining security in her absence. Of course, Dela had officially been given express orders to maintain her post until relieved, since there had to be a ranking admiral in charge. But there were orders, and then there were orders. And since both sets came from Tarkin, he could alter them as he deemed necessary. As the galaxy's only grand moth, he had extensive leeway in how he ran his portion of the navy. Nobody could question him save the Emperor. And as long as he got the job done, the Emperor wouldn't care what he did to accomplish it. Tarkin stared out the viewport at the partly assembled battle station and thought about it. The standing protocols at the Maw installation were not open to interpretation. If a non-imperial ship happened by and managed to avoid being swallowed by one of the many singularities surrounding it, the ship was to be captured and the crew interrogated as to how and why they were there. Failing the ability to capture it, there was but one other option. The vessel was to be blown to atoms. There were no exceptions. And any deck monkey with a rudimentary brain could follow those protocols. There was no need for Dela to be standing over the gunners, repeating what they all already knew. Abruptly, Tarkin made his decision. He went to his quarters and engaged his personal communications hollow unit, then sat back and waited for the connection. It was not long in coming. Well, Huff, how good to see you. The image of Dela over the hollow plate was life-sized, and the resolution very sharp. It wasn't the same as her being here, but the hollow did capture her facial expressions as well as her cold and haughty beauty well enough. Like him, she sat in a command chair. She was happy to see him, he could tell, and that pleased him. And you, Dela? How are things at the installation? She made a dismissive gesture. Less than exciting. You have news? Due to the secret nature of the experiments being done at the mall, outside communications were for the most part forbidden. With the exception of this circuit, Dela and her crew were cut off from the rest of the galaxy, save for the Emperor himself and perhaps Darth Vader. Tarkin could justify this contact for reasons of security. And if you couldn't trust a Grand Moth, then who was trustworthy? Nothing that concerns your command, he said. We are winning the war. Of course, she said with a knowing smile. He smiled in return. We have had some small problems here, but they've been rectified, fortunately, with the help of a certain imperial representative, of whom you are no doubt aware. Dela nodded. She certainly knew to whom he was referring, though she would not speak Vader's name aloud either. 
This was supposed to be a secure circuit, the signal encoded and encrypted on both ends. But neither Tarkin nor Dela trusted that. Vader had ears everywhere. And what one technician could hide, another could uncover. However, Tarkin continued, I need to give you a personal briefing, and to that end, I would have you pay us a visit. Really? When? Whenever your duties make it convenient. Both of them smiled at that one. They both knew that at this point her duties were about as exciting as a dish of curdled droat milk. The crews could do disaster in battle station drills in their sleep. Well, she said, I expect I can get away starting... What time is it now? He chuckled. Dela was the only person in the galaxy who could make him laugh. Aside from her beauty, ambition, and brains, it was one of her most endearing characteristics. Let me know when you depart. I look forward to seeing you, Admiral Dela. And I, uh, you, Grand Mop Tarkin. After he disconnected, Tarkin felt something surge in his breast. Happiness? To be sure. But something more as well, something he could not quite put a finger on. Dela was an exciting woman in many ways, not the least of which was her physical attractiveness. But her ruthlessness also called to him. She was the highest-ranking female in the Imperial Navy, due in large part to his machinations, of course, but Tarkin did not doubt that she would have eventually risen on her own. When people did not know she was female and judged her own performance scores alone, she could contend with almost any male officer in the service, and had done so. Perhaps she would not have gone so far so quickly without his aid, but without any doubt a woman of her skill and talent would not be held back. He would not have been attracted to any woman less capable. If a man could not have an equal as a mate, at least it was good to find one who could run with him. He looked around his quarters. Was it a bit dusty in here? He'd have the cleaning droids come in and put it in sparkling order straight away. Dalo was coming after all. Things must be perfect, or he would know the reason why. He smiled. They called him old behind his back, but he had fire left in him. He was sure his subordinates would be surprised if they knew just how hot that fire burned. 29. Civilian Living Quarters, Delta Sector, Construction Site, Death Star. Tila had come to the conclusion that her boss liked throwing problems at her, just to see her initial reaction. This one was easier than some, harder than others, and overall another chore she could have as well done without. Steinex looked at her expectantly. What do you think? I think you must get some kind of perverse pleasure out of bedeviling me, he laughed. The older one gets, the harder it is to find fun things to do. Your solution? T mine. Either that or you buff. Steinex laughed again louder. TMI came from T-M-A-I, which was the acronym for throw money at it. Yuba was from U-A-B-H, use a bigger hammer. Both were terms that builders and mechanics like to toss around. A whole lot of problems could be solved if one but had enough credits to buy whatever was needed to fix them, and brute force had its place, too. Neither was workable here, and she knew it but she did like making the old man laugh. Seriously, he said. Tila stood and walked to the hollow of the sleep space proposal. Closed, it looked like nothing so much as a coffin, and she knew that she wasn't the only one on whom it would leave such an impression. She gestured, and a line of glowing stats and dimensions appeared. Come on, boss, she said. You know the stats as well as I do. If we try to stuff 500 civilians who haven't had the training or the acclimation to Phobes space dimensions into things like this, the minders will have them coming out their ears. We overload the med section, the civilians don't do the work. There is no upside. He nodded. Yet we have to figure out a way, and since I am in charge, I'm making it your task. Tila muttered a particularly vile curse word. The difficulty was that they had X amount of space within which to house Y numbers of living beings. It was well known by builders throughout galactic space that many species would, without sufficient living space, 
become claustrophobic, often violently so. Humans were particularly susceptible to this, which was a problem, as something like 95% of the Death Star's projected crew were human or genetically very similar. There were ways of training human troops, combinations of hypnosis, drugs, and periods of acclimation, to offset this so that the problem would not be epidemic among the military contingent. But the civilians generally had no such training. Put folks into a sleep space the size of a coffin, and a great number of them would quickly develop psychological problems. Some non-human species, such as Gamorians and Trandoshans, could not be made to enter such places voluntarily no matter what. You didn't want someone welding a critical joint at a crucial juncture of an air supply line to be half crazed from sleep deprivation because her fear of tight places had kept her awake for several cycles. You'd think that on a station this large, the last problem they'd have would be living space, and yet some idiot who'd created the initial plans years before had thought that a chamber measuring a meter by a meter by two was sufficient room for somebody human-sized if all she or he was going to be doing in it was sleeping which is all one could possibly do in it. There wasn't room to do anything else. You had to crawl into the slot, and once inside, you couldn't sit up or even turn around. If you went in feet first, you came out head first, and vice versa. So the question here was, how to give the tenants more room? At the very least, one needed a two-meter square box so that most of the occupants could stand erect without smacking their heads into the ceiling or stretch out their arms without hitting the walls. And even that was marginal. You needed four times the room currently allotted. The problem was, where was it to come from? The available space in the civilian sectors had already been designated for other uses. Steinex knew this as well as she did, and he most likely had an answer in mind. But it was always a test with him. It wasn't as if he wanted her to fail. She didn't think that at all. But she knew he took delight when she came up with solutions, and the more novel, the better. This one, however, wasn't going to roll off the top of her head any time soon. She'd have to think about it. She said as much. He nodded. He was of the measure twice, cut once philosophy, and knew that it was better she considered the problem with due gravitas, rather than just blurting out whatever came to mind. You have until tomorrow, he said. Zero eight hundred. G12 Barracks. Sector N7, Construction Site, Death Star. Nova ducked a wild swing, caught the attacking guard's arm, and spun him into the trooper behind him. Both men fell, but he had no time to rejoice. There were others coming for him. Lots of others. He waded into a pair of guards and hit both at the same instant with a double punch, smashing their noses, then dropped and swept, upending another one. And before that one hit the deck, he was up again, firing a sidekick into the belly of yet another... He was aware that someone was fighting at his side, a human like himself, but huge, and just as good a fighter as he was. His nameless ally grabbed a guard by his front, lifted him off his feet, and headbutted the man, knocking his helmet off, then dropped him, whirled, and took out two more with a spin kick. We're having fun now, aren't we? The big man said. He laughed. Nova had no idea where he was or why he was here, fighting an entire phalanx of stormtroopers. He didn't know who his mysterious ally was either. He only knew that they were going to lose. They'd taken out a goodly number of guards, but there were still seven or eight of them standing. And the only reason Nova and the big man hadn't been roasted yet was because the fighting had been too close for the guards to use their blasters. That was about to change, however. The guards were backing away, going for their weapons. The game was about to be over. Nova felt fear welling inside him. Not for himself, he knew he was a dead man fighting. Two against fifteen, the latter armed with blasters? Owen was never in those cards. But it was vitally important that he prolong the fight as long as he could, to give the others... To give them what? To give who what? He didn't know. All he knew was that this would be his last dance, and he wanted it to be the best he could manage going up against impossible odds, going down swinging, using what he knew. There were a lot worse ways to check out. He saw the trooper draw down on him, saw the blaster's muzzle aimed at his head, knew he could never reach it in time. Nova awoke, sitting up soaked in sweat, his heart hammering. Blast.
The glow of the life support monitors bathed the small room in dim blue and green lights, enough to see that Mantalogo, the other NCO who was also off shift, was sleeping like the dead, snoring lightly. It was just the two of them. The other two sergeants who shared the room were working. Nova sat up on the edge of his rack, then slid off onto the cold floor plates. He padded into the refresher, a small unit that held a sink, a toilet, and a tight sonic shower pad. He splashed tepid water onto his face, toweled it off, looked at himself in the small mirror over the sink. The same dream. This was the fourth time he'd had it since he'd transferred onto the battle station. There were slight variations in it. Sometimes he was fighting alone, sometimes there were more guards, sometimes fewer. The last time he'd had it, he'd been crisped by the laser's energy beam and died. That had been bad. Maybe I should have the medics check me out, he thought. Yeah, right. And wouldn't that look good on his record? Bad dreams? What kind of tough guy martial arts expert are you, Steele? Going to see the doctor because of a dream. He shook his head. No. He wouldn't be doing that anytime soon. Besides, it didn't happen that often. He was usually able to go back to sleep, and he never had a repeat of the dream on the same night. Nova shrugged. Most likely it was something that the filters would eventually strain out of the air. Nothing to get all in a lather about. He'd start practicing one of the mind-clearing meditations he knew before he went to bed. That might help. If not, well, he could learn to live with it. But that sure wasn't his first choice. 30. Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. Come up with a name yet? Roto asked as they looked around the inside of the finished cantina. I think so. Officially, it was going to be given a deck, area, and room number, but unofficially, people liked descriptive names. Her southern underground establishment that had burned had been the Soft Heart. This new one, while she didn't own it, was hers to run. And given where it was and the patrons who'd frequent it, Mima thought a variation on the old name would fit. I'm calling it the Hard Heart. Roto nodded. Works for me. The construction droids and a couple of Wookiee supervisors had worked quickly. But as far as she could tell, they'd done a good job. Roto had inspected bits and pieces and seemed satisfied. The basic layout was the standard military pub cantina model she'd seen in dozens of places throughout what was now Imperial space. The main room was more or less square, with the bar running nearly the length of the east wall. In the northeast corner was a small stage, just in case they were lucky enough to get live talent for skits or music, or in case some of the drunker patrons felt moved to render heartfelt versions of their favorite songs. Unisex unispecies refreshers were sighted off the northwest wall and a manager's office next to those. There were three entrances, one each on the south and north walls, plus an emergency exit on the west wall behind the bar. Twenty tables filled the room, bolted to slides inset into the deck, each with half a dozen low-backed stools adjustable for height. If a large party came in, as many as five tables in any row could be scooted together into a larger module. The stools could also be moved, but normally were held in place with electric locks controlled by the tender from behind the bar. People could adjust seating as necessary for their size or number, but once all was in place, the tender could flip a switch and lock the stools. That way, if the crowd got rowdy, they wouldn't be using the furniture on one another. Not that such a scenario was likely with Rodo on the job, but better safe than trashed. The consumables were all behind the bar, on shelves running up the wall or underneath the counter. Liquor, puffs, eats. Food was generally pull-tab heated mod meals. You could live on them, but that was about all. A cantina was not the place for fine dining. The ceiling and tabletops had blowers and vacuums built in, and the table's units could be controlled either at the table or by tenders or servers at the bar. If the boys at table six were smoking pickled rankweed and produced billowing clouds of fragrant, intoxicating blue smoke, they could adjust the vacuums so it didn't drift like fog over the girls at table seven who were licking up spirals of kick dust, or the drinkers at table five chugging down steins of andoin ale. The air scrubbers weren't 100%, of course, but effective enough. 
The serving droid, SUB713, aka SU, rolled up looking very much like a large domed ale can. SU had been programmed with a feminine vocabulator. Stocks are topped off, boss. We are ready to soak in smoke. Mima smiled. Whoever had programmed SUB713 must have had fun doing it. Good. Run a final check on the credit interface. Make sure all the readers are online. A multicolored light array sparkled on the droid's computer screen. Copy. Money readers are green and mean. I'm going to go run internal systems checks and then defrag. Keep my drive alive. After the droid rolled away, Roto said, Professional comedian starving on the HNE circuit, and we get a head server droid who does stand up. Hey, if it keeps the troops happy. Yeah, but how am I going to get my workouts if the patrons all behave themselves? She grinned. Come on, you can help me adjust the scrubber in the oversized fresher stall. We get a couple of huts or a drac in there. We don't want the air circ to be overwhelmed. With the last few tasks completed, they were probably as ready as they were going to get, Mima decided. Everything she could think of had been seen to as best as could be managed. But she was still a little nervous. A new cantina opening was a fluttery gut thing at best. True, it was just a cantina. Nothing huge in the cosmic scheme of the Galactic Empire. But when it was your cantina, you wanted it to go well. A station like this would be around for decades and a good reputation out of the box never hurt business. She was, after all, getting at least a small piece of the action, and the better things went, the more she would make. ISD, Steel Talon. Systems reports are all normal, Admiral. Mati nodded. This tiresome business on the ship had to be done, of course, but he wanted to get it done quickly and return to the station. He felt an almost superstitious concern when he was off-site for very long. Yes, Tarkin was the moth, and he was in charge. But the real running of the station fell to Motti, as well it should. No man in the Imperial Navy had more of an interest and investment in the Death Star than Admiral Conan Antonio Motti. The captain reporting saluted and departed, and Motti glanced up at the chrono insert into the bridge wall. In another hour, he could leave, shuttle back to the station, and get back to important functions. Because superstition aside, there were also practical real-world reasons for Motti to be wary of long-enforced absences from the station. The biggest being that he didn't trust General Bast or General Tag. Both were officers from the Imperial Army contingent, and technically both outranked Admiral Motti, despite the fact that the station was a Navy venture. Tarkin, of course, being Grand Moff, was above the petty distinctions of service branches. He outranked everyone. Motti feared Tag the most. The House of Tag was an old and wealthy family, well respected in the corridors of power back on Imperial Center. Tag held sway with the Emperor, and he knew how to use it. He'd used it to land his current position as advisor to Tarkin. Bast, Tag's subordinate, was also a focus of worry. Although possessed of no personal aspirations beyond serving the Empire, he was loyal to both Tag and Tarkin, and might become an obstacle at some future point. Motti had tried to enlist Tarkin subtly in the idea that the man who controlled the battle station once it was fully operational would effectively be the most powerful person in the galaxy. It was true that the Emperor and Vader supposedly had that mystical connection with the Force, and Motti well remembered as a young man witnessing firsthand some of the astonishing accomplishments of the Jedi during the Clone Wars but not even superhuman abilities could stand against a weapon that could blow a planet to pieces. In any event, Tarkin had either not picked up on the hints, or more likely he had, but had chosen to keep his options open, and to himself. No matter. If Tarkin wanted to pretend loyalty to the withered old man who sat at the head of the Empire, that was fine. For now. Monty knew the ins and outs of the station better than anyone and he had developed a certain loyalty among the senior officers. Eventually, the time would come. If Tarkin wasn't with him, then it was the Grand Moff's misfortune. The risks were high, but so were the stakes. To be the ultimate power in the galaxy, maybe the universe? Who could walk away from that, given the chance to have it? 
31. Half a light second from Dock 1A, Equatorial Trench, Death Star. Pull up, Kendo, Vildan said. He waited for the acknowledgement, but none seemed to be forthcoming. Lieutenant Kendo, have you gone deaf? Vil's own tie vibrated as he leaned into the sharp turn, port and up, accelerating hard to avoid the robotic target drones grouped in a tight formation only 600 clicks ahead of him. Pulling up, sir, Kendo finally said. Through the comm set, the man's voice sounded, What? Laconic? No, more like... Bored. Vil watched Kendo's ship peel away from the course that would have smashed him into the drones in another two heartbeats. A sliver is as good as a parsec, the old pilot saying went, and while that might be true, following orders was more important. A fact that new recruit, Lieutenant Nand Kendo, badly needed to learn. The rest of the squad hung back a few hundred clicks, watching the newbie Kendo and the veteran dance as they made their first warm-up run at the targets. They kept the chatter down, because it didn't take a petahertz processor to see that the squadron leader was ready to bite somebody's head off and spit it halfway to the core, given this newbie's performance. They all thought they were the hottest pilots to ever lay hands on a stick when they first arrived, every one of them. Vil had felt the same way. But he had learned pretty quickly that when the squad leader told you to do something, there were reasons, and if you decided you knew more about flying than he did, it could cost you. Severely. There was no way he was going to have anything less than perfect performances on his first few weeks at his new assignment. He'd shipped over from the Steel Talon to the Death Star only a couple of weeks before, and he wanted to make sure that the brass had no reason to rethink their decision. This was a simple training exercise. Each of the squad members got solo runs at the target drones, with Lieutenant Commander Dance behind them looking over their shoulders. The first pass was to check range and distance. On the second, it was targeting lasers only, you painted the target, got the kill electronically, and the squad leader rated your run. Only on the third pass did you get to shoot for real. The drones, old freighters refitted for naval exercises, were heavily armored, and it would take a lot more than a blast from a single tie to seriously damage them. So a dozen squads could hit them before they had to be repaired. The Imperial Navy thus saved a few credits. Where you put your shot was important and you learned how to do it by full-speed runs and full-power guns, but only in steps and by the numbers. Vil had seen Kendo's targeting lasers sparkle on the lead drone, and the practice shot had been pretty good to his eyes. He checked his ship recorder on the second run's completion, and it confirmed his opinion as they curved around for the third and final run. Okay, fine, the kid could shoot, which got him no slice at all in Vil's eyes he was still a potential supercritical reaction. Listen up, Kendo, and pay close attention. You fire five seconds out, target the aft sensor array, and break off immediately, you copy? There was a two-second pause. Then, uh, copy, squad leader. Request permission to target the aft pilot port. I can hit either gun, you call it. I am sure you can, Lieutenant, but that's not the assignment I just gave you, is it? Another pause. No, sir. Good, you're teachable at least. Now bring it around and let's run it by the book. Copy. That last word had an unmistakable ring of contempt. It was as if all the arrogance of a young, full-of-himself, simulator-trained pilot was compressed into it. Hey, it said, I can do this. I don't need some gutless old squad commander I can fly circles around holding my hand. He couldn't help but grin. He had only three years on Kendo. Nevertheless, sometimes he felt more like 30 years older than the newbies. He made no reply, just hung zero and watched Kendo make a sharp and well-executed half-roll as he lined up for his run. The kid could fly. But could he do what he was told? Ahead, the six drones sailed serenely through the blackness. They were programmed to activate defensive weapons, Low-powered beams that were enough to rattle your teeth if one hit your fighter, but not strong enough to cause any real damage. Anybody paying attention could avoid these, but it took practice. In the real world, even a freighter could get lucky and blow you out of the void, and that's what training was for, to teach you how to avoid such mishaps. Ties were fast, but they had neither life support nor shielding. A solid hit from any real weapon, 
could crisp you like a mulch fritter. Kendo accelerated. A hair faster than called for, but Vil held off calling him on it. Let's see what you can do with it, kid. The newbie zipped toward the target. Vil checked his Doppler ping. Seven seconds, six, five. Shoot, Vil said. No response. Kendo shoot and pull up, but Kendo kept boring in, drawing closer to the lead drone. The stupid Mopac, he's going for the pilot port. Pull up, Lieutenant, that's an order, pull up now. The drone fired its port guns. The attenuated strobe hit Kendo's fighter. It wasn't enough to hurt him, but it must have been enough to startle him. He fired, flared to port. Too late. A quarter second sooner on the turn and he'd have missed. But as it was, the TIE's starboard solar array hit the drone's nose. The impact tore the array from the fighter, the energy collection coils unraveling spasmodically like a beheaded snake. The power lines sparked in cold vacuum as they were torn apart. The housing snapped, and the impact spun the craft into a wild tumble. Vil shoved the stick, feeling G-force slap him hard, knowing it was far too late to do anything but watch. Kill the power. Kill the... The fuel tank separated from the hull. The seal held, but the fuel line stretched, stretched. Vil could see it happen, slowly, as if time had stalled out. The line snapped, spewing the radioactive gas in a sudden cloud toward the tumbling craft. Something, a shattered circuit board perhaps, sparked. There was a soundless eye-burning flash. Blast! Vil shouted. Blast, blast, blast! Blast! 32. The Hardheart Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. Retua's identification wasn't bomb-proof, but short of a destructive analysis, it would pass any casual scan by anybody. Not, he marveled yet again, that anybody seemed to give a Brazzes behind enough to bother to ask to see it. From the look of the station, it would, when finished, be impregnable from outside attack. Nobody was going to be able to throw much of anything at it that was going to cause it any real problems. And yet here he was, walking around like it was his personal ship, ostensibly a contractor. Had he been a rebel saboteur, he could have been busy causing a world of problems, absolutely unchecked for weeks. How ironic was that? Of course, he wasn't a rebel of any kind. He didn't have much use for politics. Never had. Couldn't see that he ever would. For a man in his, uh, profession, whoever was in charge, Empire, Alliance, his dear old Uncle Tunia, didn't really matter. Unless Black Sun managed to take over, whoever ran the show would want to see Ratua stashed in a cell somewhere. But he wasn't in a cell now. In fact, he had it pretty cushy. Plenty of credits stashed here and there, a fake identity that nobody questioned, even a legitimate semi-private room, courtesy of a bribe to a poor clerk with a slight gambling problem. Everything a man might want. Okay, almost everything. He could use a little female companionship, and he was working on that. A new cantina had just opened a few levels from where he roomed. He'd heard people talking about the place, and it sounded like fun, so he was on his way to check it out. He wasn't big on chems, but he didn't mind having an ale now and then to brighten up a dull evening. The cantina, which had a small glowing sign that read The Hard Heart above the double portal, seemed fairly busy. He stepped in through the air and caught the smells of a working pub. Fragrant smoke, warm beverages, some body odors from patrons who should have showered before they came in. Mostly Navy guys, some contractors, more males than females, which was hardly surprising. Most of the customers were human or humanoid stock, close enough that it was hard to tell the difference. Lighting was low enough to afford a kind of privacy, but not so dim it didn't offer a useful spectrum. His species could see a little deeper into the ultraviolet than some, but not as far into the infrared as others. Still, he wouldn't be bumping into the walls here. The tables were mostly full, but there were a few empty spaces at the bar, which ran most of the right-hand wall from where he'd entered. Ratua moved through the crowded tables, being careful, with an ease born of long practice, not to bump anybody or loom into anyone's space unexpectedly. Surprise some folks and they'd shoot without a second thought, and military types were faster on the trigger than a lot of civilians. 
but it looked like that wouldn't be a problem here. He noticed a sigil over the mirror behind the bar. You stood for unarmed. That was a good idea. Navy guys seemed to enjoy wearing a sidearm everywhere they went, get them soused and angry, and stray blaster bolts could be a problem. Bad enough if you annoyed somebody to the point where he was ready to pull his weapon and cook you, even worse if you were minding your own business and you caught a bolt aimed at somebody else. Ratua achieved the bar. There were a couple of droid servers working the floor, one behind the bar, and a most attractive Twi'lek woman with lovely teal-colored skin that showed wherever her short-sleeved coverall left her bare, places that added up to a satisfyingly large number. How may I serve you? one of the droids said. How sale, he said. Two credits. Your debit number? Cash. Ratua dropped two coins into the droid's cash drawer, which extruded from its torso to receive them. After a moment, the droid tendered a mug of amber-colored ale with a centimeter of frothy foam for a head. Thanks, Ratua said. The ale was cold, crisp, with a hint of something tart under the hops nice. He turned slightly, mug in hand, and observed the room. Next to the far wall, just to the right of the second entrance, stood a large human. He was watching the patrons without looking at anyone in particular. Ratua felt the man's gaze touch him and move on. This would be in-house security, and from the looks of him, not a fellow with whom you'd want to argue. Ratua had seen many violent men on many planets, many of whom were just naturally mean, and some who had a certain competent look about them that bespoke training and ability. This guy was one of those. Step crooked here and you'd find yourself unceremoniously displaced to the outside corridor. Start a real fuss, and you would clearly soon wish you hadn't. That's Rodo, a female voice said from behind the bar. He doesn't bite. He doesn't have to. Ratua looked. The Twi'lek woman stood there smiling at him. He nodded, saluted her with his ale. And I would guess that a sensible person would not care to become the object of Rodo's irritation. In that you would be correct. I'm Mima Ruthis. I run the place. Ratua nodded again. He considered giving her his fake identity, but for some reason he could not begin to understand. He went with his real name instead. Salat Ratua Dill he said. I liked the joint when I walked in, and I like it even better now that we've met. Ooh, a lady's man. Her voice was amused, but there was also a hint of interest. At least he hoped so. Not me, me, Maruthus, he replied. Just one who appreciates good ale and beautiful females. Welcome to the hard heart, Salat Ratchuadil. You're a contractor? Actually, I recently escaped from the prison planet. I'm just conning my way along. She raised an appreciative eyebrow. A sense of humor is worth a lot around here. He looked around, noting the bright colors and decorations that softened, but didn't completely disguise the hard angles and general severity of the architecture. Impressive as the Empire's new weapon was, it wasn't going to win any design awards. I can see that. I guess there's more than one reason for calling it the Death Star. And, he added, call me Ratua, please. He smiled and raised his mug again. May I buy you a drink? Too early to start this shift, Mima Ruthis said. But if you're still here in an hour or so, maybe I'll take you up on that. Ratua grinned. A herd of wild banthas couldn't drag me away. She turned aside to serve a new customer, and he watched her, admiring the lithe way she moved. Oh, yes, he was definitely going to be spending some quality time in here. 33. Operating Theater, Med Center, Death Star. The surgery was not going as well as it should have. Yuli was getting frustrated. Get a presser on that bleeder, stat, he said. The surgical assistant, an MDS-3 droid, was a stationary unit built into the suite. It used a thin and flexible arm to clamp a field reader onto the cut vein. The flow of blood stopped. The droid adroitly sponged up the blood in the cavity, said... Sponge four, aloud, removed the sponge from the endoscopic incision and dropped the soaked pledge into the waste bin. Wipe, Yuli said. The droid used another of its multiple arms to run a sterile cloth over Yuli's forehead, 
blotting away the perspiration that threatened to run into his eyes. There were anti-sweat films that could be sprayed on to temporarily keep perspiration at bay, but Yuli didn't like them. Most of them made him itch. Carving humans and humanoids was generally no problem for him. He could do clone surgery in his sleep, might actually have done so a couple of times back when he was in the field, working long shifts and patching up scores of wounded every day. But natural genetics sometimes threw a sport at you. A body that wasn't built exactly the same way most of that particular species were normally constructed. The Navy major here on the surgical table was one of those sports. And if Yuli didn't figure out what he needed to know, and fast, the major could become an interesting statistic. Three hours earlier, a 40-year-old human male from the planet Bakura had presented to the screening medic complaining of nausea, loss of appetite, low-grade fever, and pain in his abdomen. Symptoms were classically consistent with an inflamed appendix. The medical examiner made the diagnosis and sent the patient along for surgery. Normally, a surgical droid would have handled an operation like this quickly and efficiently. But the battle station was still understaffed and under-equipped, so Yuli had shrugged and scrubbed. It should have been a routine appendectomy, the kind of ho-hum surgery any first-year resident could do one-handed. Except when Yuli shoved an endoscope into the major to find the inflamed appendix, he encountered a slight problem. It wasn't there. At least it wasn't where it was supposed to be. This was impossible, but Yuli didn't waste time questioning the image on the screen. Do a tomographic axial scan and find that appendix, he told the MD droid. Yes, doctor, the droid replied. Its imaging scanners hummed. A thin green line appeared and moved from the patient's groin to his chest, mapping the length and width of the scan. TA scan complete. Show me. A hologramic projection, life-sized, appeared over the patient, floating in the pale bluish glow of the OT's UV sterility lamps. Yuli looked. I still don't... Oh, there it is. What the frip is it doing there? It was a rhetorical question, but the droid answered it anyhow. Cross-checking against my data files indicates an anatomical abnormality, doctor. Brilliant. Yuli shook his head. Fate save him from literal-minded droids. But there was no time to be annoyed at the MDS-3. The appendix was swollen to what looked like four times normal size, though its unusual location made it hard to see, even though he now knew where it was. His mind ran through various choices. He'd have to open the man up a bit more, or get an endoscopic arm in to snip and glue. Yeah, that would be the best way. Least invasive. Extrude a number six endoscope with an SS clamp and seal off that appendix. Yes, doctor. Another thin appendage snaked from the droid's housing. This one bore a two-tined fork. The upper one was a self-cleaning cam lens, while the lower tine, five centimeters longer, held an open surgical steel clamp. The droid deftly inserted the arm into the patient. The hollow appeared over the man, showing the fork's progress. Unerringly, the droid positioned the clamp at the base of the inflamed appendix and then snapped it shut. A second arm, an endosnipper, slid in and with an actinic flash of laser light, removed the appendix. A vacuum attachment sucked out any possible contaminants. The droid removed the surgical arms and tissue. Yuli breathed easier. Do a scan of the appendix for any pathogens and order antigen motes effective for anything you find. Yes, doctor. Send me a copy of the lab work and prescriptions. Yes, doctor. Okay, close him up and have an orderly take him to the ward. Yes, doctor. Yuli turned away from the patient. Before such things as axial scans and precision surgical droids, they might have lost this patient, digging around looking for a lost appendix that was about to pop but the major would survive and likely go on to slaughter hundreds or maybe thousands more people before the war ended. The irony of it all wasn't hard to see. Super Laser Fire Control, Theta Sector, Death Star. So what do you think, Chief? Mekar Doan slapped the main control console. Ten Granite grinned at his fellow petty officer. Oh, it's a first-class craft, right enough. The two men were standing in a small nexus chamber overlooking the eight radiating particle accelerator tubes designed to feed the super laser beam. The walls were covered with readout meters, fluctuating bar graph monitors, banks of controls, and other equipment. 
Much of it was beyond CPO-10 Granite's knowledge, but that was all right. He didn't need to know everything about how it worked. He just had to be able to work it. Chief Doan laughed. You think you can shoot it once everything's hooked up? Ten gave him a fake, astonished look. You shot it, didn't you? When I can't hit anything you can, I'll retire. You read the specs? Ten nodded. Yeah, it could be a planet cracker if it works like it's supposed to. Engineers say it will. Engineers. Ten put a considerable amount of sarcasm in the word. Yeah, I hear that. But they're pulling out all the stops on this baby. He rubbed his hand on the control console. Any problem they had, they threw enough money at it to bury it to the rails. We'll add the power, no worries there. And if somebody didn't forget to dog a bolt tight, maybe it won't blow us all to the other side of the rim. Hey, I'm telling you, word is the worst piece of gear on it is still triple redundant. I had a nephew who was a deck monkey on the battle lands, Ten said. Doan's smile faded. Yeah. I knew a couple of guys shipped on her. It was a freak accident. Maybe. A backfire could overload the HM reactor and turn the station into radioactive dust, too. Doan shook his head. Never a happen. They got the Emperor himself looking over their shoulders on this one. They won't frip it up. Ten shrugged. There was little point in worrying about equipment failure. If the thing worked, it would prove the Death Star to be, as Tarkin had put it in one of his many inspirational addresses to the station's population, the ultimate power in the galaxy. If it didn't work, well, the hypermatter reactor was capable of generating an energy burst equivalent to the total weekly output of several main-sequence stars. If anything went wonky, it wasn't likely he'd be around long enough to notice, nor would anyone else. Yeah, well, he replied. If they can build it so it holds together, I'll shoot it. Let me show you how it works. You and your team will be practicing on the simulator until the real thing here is online. As Doan explained the intricacy of the sequencing relays, Ten found it somewhat difficult to concentrate on what the other man was saying. He wasn't sure why. After all, he'd dreamed of this moment for months, the day he'd finally stand in the control chamber of the super laser and be officially given command of it. Even though construction wasn't finished yet, you couldn't tell it from in here. He listened to the susurration of the klystron tubes and thermistor couplers, smelled the astringent scent of insulation lube, felt the breath of conditioned air adjusted to a constant 20 degrees, and wondered why he was not content. There was only one reason that seemed remotely feasible. The battle lands. His nephew Hora Granit had been a Navy spacer on the Imperial-class Star Destroyer Mark II-class vessel, which had been selected for a shakedown cruise testing one of the improved prototype hypermatter reactors. Ten didn't know the specifics of what had happened, and didn't have anything close to the math needed to understand it anyway. He knew that hypermatter existed only in hyperspace, that it was composed of tachyonic particles, and that charged tachyons, when constrained by the lower dimensions of real space, produced near-limitless energy. How this null-point energy had become unstable, he didn't know. He only knew it had been powerful enough to turn an ISD-2 and its crew of 37,000 people into floating wisps of ionized gas in a microsecond. So, don't tell me you're scared, Granit. You knew the risks. This is a war, declared or not. Wars have casualties. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't even so much that Hora had been a favorite nephew, or that the younger Granite had admired his uncle so much that he'd enlisted, which made Ten feel a considerable amount of responsibility for his death. It was the thought of that much power, and the possibility of it becoming uncontrollable. Again, Ten surprised himself. He'd never been overly concerned about fallible technology before. His was not to reason why. He was the trigger man and he was being handed the biggest gun in the galaxy, with the safety off. But was he capable of wielding such power wisely? Was anyone? 34. Docking Bay 6, Alpha Sector, Death Star. Dela came down the ramp looking every centimeter the Imperial Admiral. She didn't just walk, 
she swept, and it was a joy to watch her stride. Strong, smart, ambitious, dedicated, funny, and beautiful. What more could a man possibly want in a partner? Well, a bit more proximity would be good. But they were both creatures of duty, and Tarkin knew that wasn't apt to change any time soon. Certainly not until the battle station was finished and unlimbered. Perhaps not even then. He knew that Dela looked upon him with much favor, but the relationship had always been secondary to her career. He understood that. More, he admired it. He wouldn't want a woman who thought any less of herself. That was the ultimate paradox, of course. Grand Moff Tarkin. So good to see you again, sir. Tarkin held his smile in check. One had to be proper about such things out in plain sight. Admiral Dela, the pleasure is mine. I trust your trip was uneventful? Yes, sir, nothing untoward whatsoever. Excellent. Allow me to show you to your quarters. Your suite, as it happens, is right next to mine. He saw a flicker of anticipation cross her face, hardly enough to notice unless one was standing right in front of her. In a very quiet voice, without moving her lips, she said, How convenient, Will Huff. He couldn't keep from smiling, despite his best efforts. This way, Admiral. He extended one hand to show her the direction. She gave him a military nod, and they moved off past the honor guard. As they walked, she stared about the hangar, impressed. I knew it would be huge, but the reality of it hadn't quite come home. Save your awe for when it's finished and operational, which will be quite soon now. The Rebel Alliance won't know what hit them. Oh, they'll know, my dear. Everyone will know. That's the point. She had cut her hair shorter than when last they had been together. It was flattering on her. But then he'd never seen her with a hairstyle that wasn't flattering. There weren't really any regulations about how female admirals should dress or groom themselves. Dela was the only one, after all. And who would dare to tell her? She had risen on merit alone but certainly her ascent to the command ranks had caused some speculation about her relationship with Tarkin and how that might have smoothed the way. Nobody speculated about it in earshot of him, of course. Not anymore, because those foolish few who'd done so had had their ashes scattered to the four solar winds. Tarkin had not reached the unique rank he held by allowing his enemies any quarter whatsoever. Yes, Dela had been his protégé, and yes, he had opened doors for her a bit sooner than she might have managed on her own but she had made flag command without his help. There were plenty of male admirals unfit to polish her boots. They soon reached the door to her quarters. Shall we go inside and discuss this further? He murmured to her. By all means, Grand Moff Tarkin. Before the door had slid completely shut behind them, she was in his arms. Library and Archives, Deck 106, Sector N1, Death Star. The library aboard the battle station wasn't the biggest Atur had ever seen by any means. He had done his apprenticeship in the Baobab archives on Manda, although these days he didn't deem it exactly prudent to highlight that fact on his resume. And from there, he had gone on to be the archivist of such repositories as the Dorismus Apenneum on Corellia and the hollow repository on the Wheel World, Arkham 13. The latter was known for having the largest collection of lore on the Old Republic outside the temple. It wasn't the most exciting of lives, that of an archivist, but it was one that suited him well. He had not, as many supposed, always been introspective and scholarly. As a young man, he'd fought for the Janissariat in the Baldurin Civil War. The experience had left a foul taste in his mouth for any and all forms of centralized government. Disgusted with politics, Atur Wrighton had retreated, in soul if not body, into the misty past. It was a decision he'd never regretted. The Death Star Library, as his mind insisted on naming it, was supposed to eschew the use of hollow books, tapes, and crons, and rely instead on phononic lattice storage. This would allow storage of a huge amount of information in a very small space. Part of Atur's brief in this new job was to supervise the droids scanning information from other media into lattice form. Even on something the size of the Death Star, space was at a premium, at least for such things as data storage. 
though he'd seen bigger and better. The amount of data accrued was impressive nonetheless. The files were extensive, the retrieval systems were thick with memory to speed up downloads, and the broadcaster-reader circuitry was top-notch. It was a pity that most people didn't actually go to libraries anymore. Not when they could sit in the comfort of their own quarters and access files electronically. Want to read the new hot interstellar caper novel? Or the latest issue of Beings Holocene? Input the name, touch a control, and zip. It's in your data pad. Need to study the history of winged intelligent species? No more difficult than inputting search parameters than scanning the bibliographic references and choosing a place to begin. There were, of course, old-fashioned beings who would still actually trundle down to where the files were. On some worlds, the most ancient libraries kept books, actual bound volumes of printed matter, lined up neatly on shelves. And readers would walk the aisles, take a volume down, sniff the musty, dusty odor of it, and then carry it to a table to leisurely peruse. There weren't many of those readers left, and they were growing rarer all the time. This Satur knew from experience. But there were some who still knew how to actually turn a page, and for those who were willing to do so, the rewards could be great indeed. Of course, Satur was no Luddite antiquarian who grumbled and inveighed against the modern world. On the contrary, he'd been praised by experts as a slicer of excellent quality, and it had served him well more than once to have knowledge he wasn't supposed to. One didn't normally think of the data storage and information retrieval business as being particularly cutthroat, but it must be remembered that in Palpatine's empire, every business was cutthroat, and if one was the head librarian and archivist, such files were accessible, even without high-level clearance. He hadn't spent a lifetime among the stacks without learning a trick or two. Thus it was that Wrighton found himself looking at a set of plans for this battle station a.k.a. the Death Star. He was no engineer to understand all the schematics, and the documents were fat with technical jargon. But anyone with even a smattering of a general education could see the wonder of the place. It was a monster in size and in intent, as well as in killing ability. Or it would be once they assembled all of the weaponry and got it operational. Fascinating material. For more than a few years, Atur Wrighton had, when he discovered such interesting and potentially useful files, copied them and logged them into a personal folder that was virtually impossible to slice. In addition to the best military wards and pyro walls, the folder was also protected by a random number generated by a quantum computer, said number being 47 digits long. Moreover, the program would shift each digit one value lower or higher every six standard hours, and only somebody with the code to access the program running it could keep track of this shift. One had to know the date and hour the program generated the number in order to follow the sequence. It was a slow and unwieldy process, hardly suitable for files that needed to be accessed with any frequency, but workable for him. Once the files were copied, he needed a safe place to keep them. For some time, ever since he had run the military base's library there, he had sent the files to Danuta, a planet of no great import or value, save for its mildly strategic location. It was easy enough to piggyback the coded information onto an imperial message comm, or even a holocom, another trick he had learned in his years of accessing military secrets. Someday, if he lived long enough, Atur intended to write a history of the times that had begun with the Clone Wars and run through the current conflict between the Empire and the Rebel Alliance. Of course, he had to wait and see who won before he could get to that part. But he was always on the lookout for research material. The plans for this battle station, upon which the war in progress might well hinge, certainly seemed worthy of a place in that research. He'd have to write the account under a pseudonym, of course, no matter which side won. They would want to have words with the author of such a tome, which would hold both sides up to a bright light that would flatter neither. Likely, the information would be suppressed but that didn't matter. There would always be copies of it floating around, and beings who wished to know its contents. Knowledge was like that. Once it was ushered into the light, putting it back into the shadows was difficult, if not impossible. Atur leaned back in his form chair, which offered a silent adjustment to his contours. Had to give the Empire its due. When they wanted to, they could provide first-class environments. His office was testimony to that. 
he gestured at the computer's cam, moving his fingers in a pattern that said, Wipe all records of this access. The hollow blinked once, and it was done. Now he needed to find a comsig leaving the station and link and route his stolen files to it. Communications were restricted at this base, of course, but if you went high enough up the chain of command, there was always someone who was allowed to talk to someone else. And since any officer foolish enough to risk his career by stealing a ride on a superior officer's communications probably wouldn't have been assigned here in the first place, the techs most likely didn't bother to look too closely at the messages they were generating. And even if they did, they wouldn't see Atur's addition if they didn't know exactly where and how to look. The chink in the armor of powerful beings was that they believed power made them smarter as well as blaster-proof. It had been Atur Wrighton's experience that neither of these things was true. He wove a complicated two-handed pattern at the computer cam, which began scanning comm frequencies, looking for a ride. Eventually, he would find one. There was no hurry. Meanwhile, it was time for lunch. 35. Exercise Suite, Executive Level, Death Star Mati prided himself on keeping fit. Stripped to a speed strap and drenched in his own sweat, he was working out in the executive officer's heavy gravity room, which he'd set at a 3G pull. Just standing in such a field was an effort. Every movement required three times the energy it normally did. Even jumping was risky. Landed a bad angle and you could break an ankle. Trip and fall, and the impact could fatally crack your skull. Motti picked up a trio of densoplast workout balls, each the size of his fist. Anywhere else on the station, they would weigh about a kilo each. In the HG room, they were three apiece. Juggling them caused his muscles to quickly burn. His shoulders, arms, hands, back, all were protesting the effort as he tossed and caught the balls. He could manage the three most basic patterns, the cascade, which was the easiest, the reverse cascade, a bit harder, and the shower, in which the balls all circled in the same direction. If he dropped one, it was usually during the shower pattern, and the first thing he had learned when juggling in the HG room was to move his feet out of the way quickly if he dropped a ball. Three kilos, moving three times faster than normal, could easily break bones or crush toes. Today, despite the burning in his muscles, he was a machine, moving perfectly, and the balls stayed aloft, moving in sync without any flaw. He was aware that a couple of other senior officers were watching him from one corner of the room, and he smiled to himself. Being fit was important. If you were physically stronger than the men around you, it made them look upon you with the most basic level of respect. Cross me and I can break you in half. He was not, nor would he ever be, some fat and out-of-shape form chair officer who'd wheeze and run out of breath if he had to climb a flight of steps. He began to juggle the three heavy balls faster, shortening the arcs, bringing his elbows in closer to his body, tightening the pattern. The balls, which had been flying over his head, settled lower, and persistence of vision made them almost look as if they were a wheel rotating on an axle in front of him. Soon he would be able to add another one to the circle and juggle four. It might seem a trivial thing, but it wasn't. It was a metaphor for how to live one's life. A man could do almost anything he wished, if he wanted it enough. The Hard Heart Cantina, Death Star Sergeant Steele didn't spend much time in pubs or cantinas. Now and again he'd go, mostly to show he was a regular trooper who didn't mind having a couple of brews with the other men, but not all that often. An evening spent in a cantina would be one in which he could have been working on his fighting art or reading some epistemological treatise. Also, mind-altering substances did bad things for your motor skills, and it was hard to overcome the inertia of a few ales or some brain-fogging chem once you were done. Much easier than to sit on a soft chair and watch the entertainment hollows than to go work out which was definitely not the road to mastery. One of the troopers in his unit had gotten engaged, however, and the shift had an excuse to celebrate. So Nova had gone along, since the man was also a student of his. It was a nice enough joint, clean, well-ventilated, the crowd noisy, but not over the top. Obviously, the place to be off hours in this sector, as it was standing room only. And the ale was cold. 
he noticed a security guy watching things, and after a few minutes of surreptitiously watching him watch the crowd, Nova had marked him as a player. He stood head and shoulders over most of the crowd, but he wasn't dependent just on his heft, that was obvious. The man was a fighter. Nova didn't know which art he favored or what kind of combat moves he had, but there was definitely something there. After so many years of dancing the dance, you could tell just by the way a man stood or leaned against a wall. It was subtle. There was an attention to balance and stances, a way of shifting weight that, if you knew what to look for, was easy to see. This guy could take care of himself and anybody else in here who might want to give him trouble as well. Except for Sergeant Steele, of course. He smiled into his ale. It was only a second and two hours, and there were still three quarters of the purple liquid left. He'd already burned up the alcohol from the first mug, and he had no intention of continuing to drink enough to dull his wits. His days of getting hammered in public were long past. What was the point in having skills in a martial art if you were too fuzz-headed to use them when the need arose? He'd once seen a bunduki player, a guy who had won top-level matches, get soused at a cantina in a dirt-side dive. The player had gotten into a tiff with a local, and because he was drunk, had gotten his butt thumped pretty good, despite his skill. Nova wasn't going to find himself in that position, not if he could help it. And he didn't go to cantinas to fight. It was just plain stupid. You never knew who had a vibroblade tucked away in a back pocket, or a couple of friends who would jump in unexpectedly to help out when you squared off. Nova was to wonder later if there really was anything to the metaphysical theory that thinking such thoughts gave them a higher probability of actually occurring. Maybe if he'd been thinking about doing his laundry or herding workers into the mess hall, the guy walking past wouldn't have stumbled at that moment. Maybe. Or maybe it had something to do with Blink. Blink was his private name for a knack he had for anticipating things, particularly movements of opponents. Many times during a fight, he would know somehow, before the movement began, that the other guy was going to throw an elbow or a kick. Of course, being able to anticipate your rival's next move was the essence of good fighting, but Blink went beyond that. Not even years of practice could tell you, for example, if an antagonist was about to activate a hidden portable confounder, a sensory scrambling device that could momentarily throw you off balance, or if another fighter was coming around the corner as back up to the first. But these things, and others, had happened to Nova. And he'd known somehow. Whatever the reason, he saw the man who was carrying a platter of mugs filled with ale he had collected at the bar catch his boot on a stool leg, and because the stool was locked down, the leg didn't move. The guy started to fall directly toward Nova, who, without thinking, stood, reached out with his left hand, and tapped the falling man on the shoulder, deflecting him to the side, so that instead of dropping the platter of mugs into Nova's lap, the man fell past him half a meter to the right. The mugs flew, showering fizzy ale and gouts every which way. The platter hit the floor well ahead of their former owner, who managed to break his fall with his hands. Then, big, drunk, and really irritated, he shoved away from the floor, came up, and spun to face Nova. You okay, friend? Nova asked. No, I'm not, milking okay. What did you trip me for? Nova shook his head. I didn't. You cut your foot on the stool right there. You calling me a liar? Just telling you what I saw. You tripped me, then you shoved me. Nope. I just kept you from landing on top of me. Sorry. It was a reflex. The man balled his hands into fists. His face, already red, got more so. Nova sighed. He knew the signs. Any second now. The man stepped in and threw a hard, straight, right lead punch at Nova's face. Nova turned his head, brought his left hand up to deflect the fist a bit, and with the open palm of his right hand, smacked the attacker on the left temple, staggering him. Before the guy could do more than blink, Nova switched hand positions and thumped the heel of his left hand into the man's right temple. The man fell again. Not unconscious, but not far from it. You about done, Sergeant, came a soft voice from behind him. Nova had felt rather than seen the big security man come up from his right side. I think so. Nova turned to find the bouncer looming before him. Terras Cassie.
the bouncer said. It was not a question. Yep, the big man nodded. Highline, mirror tools, nice. I'm Roto. Nova Steel. A couple of heartbeats passed. You were a little slow getting here, Nova said. Not really, I saw you come in. I didn't think you'd need any help. Roto looked down at the dazed man. And you wanted to see? Roto shrugged. Sure, wouldn't you? Nova grinned. Oh, yeah. Roto's grin matched his own. Next ale is on me. I think I'm done drinking. Yeah, that's why I offered. He paused, then added, There's a guy teaches Teres Cassie classes down levels. That would be me. Maybe I might drop by. I'd like that. You're welcome any time. Roto bent, and with what looked like almost no effort, lifted the still-confused man to his feet. What say we call it a night and head home, hey, friend? The man nodded. Yeah, I'm very tired. What happened? You tripped. Oh, wow. Nova Steele waited until Roto had the drunk firmly in hand before he sat again. He noticed that the other troopers at the tables were looking at him with a certain amount of something in their faces. Wonder, amazement, respect, fear. All of the above, probably. Next round is on me, Nova said, to celebrate the union of Sergeant Dillwit here and his poor unlucky betrothed. The men laughed, and that was the end of that. Mima Ruthus was preparing a drink made up of ten different colored layers of liquid, and it required some precision to keep the fluids from bleeding into one another. She had the first seven poured into a cylindrical crystal as long and as big around as Roto's forearm. The last three layers were the hardest, but as long as she kept a steady hand, she'd manage. It was a pain in the glutes manipulating the various densities, but the concoction, which would serve four, went for fifty credits, so it was worth the five minutes it took. When it was finished, Mima sat back and looked at it. Perfect. Roto appeared at the end of the bar as the server droid collected the drink, called for some reason Ruthus had never understood, a walk in the fallopian forest, and wheeled away with it. Nice work, he said. Thanks. You too. I noticed you didn't kick the sergeant out. Nah, pure self-defense. I'd have done the same. Went down pretty fast. Yeah, a guy is really good. System class, fighter, easy. Didn't expect to find somebody like that out here in the middle of nowhere. Why not? It's a warship, right? Yes. But the really good ones are either out in the killing fields using the stuff, or back in civilization teaching it to recruits. First one is okay. Second is a waste. Here, it's just unusual. Mima shook her head. Males, always with the violence. You want to go a couple of rounds with this guy, don't you? Roto grinned. I wouldn't mind. You want to stay sharp, you got to hone yourself against the best you can find. Just friendly competition. Nobody gets hurt. Well, not hurt too bad. Mima shook her head again. Roto drifted away. Even though she was busy... She caught a glimpse of green eyes sitting over in the corner, sipping an ale. Now there was an interesting male. A Zolotian, he'd said. Not a species she'd ever run into before. She'd warped the hollow net a little, looking for a general data on his kind, and found surprisingly little. They seemed to be a strange genetic mixture of plant and animal, unable to crossbreed with any other humanoids. Not that she was overly concerned about that, as she saw no urgent need for younglings in her future. She found him oddly compelling. Yes, he had an easy smile and a relaxed manner. Plus, he wasn't hard to look at. But he was more than that. There was a kind of resonance, if that was the right word. As though they had known each other for a long time, even though they had only met recently. He pretended to be a moderately successful contractor, but whatever he was, that wasn't it. She'd had Rodo do a little checking on him as well. And as far as this station was concerned, no such person as Silat Ratua Dill existed, which meant he was a rogue of some kind, working the angles. 
and her heart had sunk when she'd learned that. She shook her head as she filled half a dozen mugs with black Mon Calamari seaweed mash, and she pondered, not for the first time, the question, why couldn't she find a decent, hard-working, ordinary kind of male who wanted to grow old together? Why was she always attracted to the bad boys, the ones without two honest credits to rub together, the ones with no real prospects? Mima sighed as she prepared another drink. Ah, uh, well. If it wasn't for kissing bad boys, she'd never get any kissing done at all. Not that she'd gotten a lot of even that lately. She put the drinks up. Order up, she said. The server droid rolled up to collect the tray. Well, she was going to be stuck here for another year and some before her contract ran out. Maybe green eyes could help the time go easier. 36. Super Laser Simulator, Theta Sector, Death Star. CPO-10 Granite had been assured that the mock-up of the battery control room for the super laser was an exact replica of the as-yet-unfinished one down to the last rivet. Every function that was to be found in the soon-to-be-working ultimate weapon was replicated in the simulator. The gunnery team would spend long hours training at the mock-up's consoles, programming the complicated firing procedure into their brains, so that when the actual control room became operational, switching to the real thing, would be as easy as falling off a bantha. Which was a good thing, because the super laser battery wasn't a simple installation. It was, in fact, far more complex than any gun control in any ship in the Imperial Navy that Ten had ever encountered. There were banks of lighted switches, color-coded for each of the eight tributary sub-beams, monitors double-stacked around the wall that showed every function of the hypermatter reactor and generator, Sensor readings from the heart of the reactor to the field amplifiers, the inducer, the beam shaft. Taken all together, it made a heavy destroyer's biggest gun look like a child's toy. Each component had to be precisely tuned and focused. If the primary beam focusing magnet was off a nanometer, the tributary beams would not coalesce, and there was a good chance of imbalance explosions in the beam shaft if the tributaries weren't pulsed in at exactly the proper time and in the proper sequence. The techs and engineers tended to wave that possibility off as too small to worry about. One chance in a hundred million, they said. Ten wasn't swallowing that. When it came to something this potentially deadly, no odds were long enough. It was true that there were automatic fail-safes, but Ten, and any chief worth his salt, trusted them just about as far as he could stroll in hard vac. Some of those engineers lived in skyhooks so far up past the clouds that they'd forgotten what the ground looked like. If a gun's designer wasn't willing to stand next to it when it was being tested, well, Ten saw no reason to be there either. Triggering a monster like this wasn't like pressing the firing stud on a blaster. At optimum, it would take 15 or 20 seconds from the given command to fire until the main beam was ready to be unleashed. And they hadn't gotten close to that yet. Half the time during firing simulations, they couldn't balance the phase harmonics enough to shoot the primary beam at all. And even if the magnetic ring was precisely stabilized, all it would take was one of the tributaries warbling so much as a microhertz out of phase, and the others would desynchronize as well. The result would be a feedback explosion along the beam shaft and back to the main reactor that would turn the battle station into an incandescent plasma cloud in less than a single heartbeat. And the Empire thanks your family very much for your sacrifice. That wasn't going to happen on his watch, Ten vowed. By the time the actual battery was operational, Ten expected his crew to be running the program smooth as lube on polished, densicrous plate. But they weren't there yet. Not even within a parsec of close. Fortunately, they had plenty of time to practice. The crew half of whom Ten had swiped from his old unit with help from his new commander, were sharp enough. But it took twelve people working the battery to properly light the big gun and make it go bang, and every one of them had to nail his or her part dead on. There was no margin for error. So far in the first dozen run-throughs, they had been able to fire the primary beam five times within a minute of the order. Once they'd taken two minutes, and four times, they hadn't been able to focus the tributaries properly at all, resulting in complete failures to fire. One time, the computer had registered a late, minor, beam warble that would have resulted in an automatic shutdown of the primary power feed to avoid damage, 
which meant it would have taken an hour to get back up for ignition sequencing. And wouldn't that be a delightful job, recalibrating everything with the land batteries of a rebel base spewing hard energy at you? In addition to the real problems, there had been a simulated major run malfunction with multiple beam warbles and disharmonic phasing. The computer, in theory, could have shut that one down in time, but Ten thought that report was optimistic. In a real situation with a fully powered weapon, that one would more than likely have turned a whole lot of beings, equipment, and everything else into sizzling ions racing toward the edges of the galaxy. All right, boys, let's see if we can get it right this time. I want everything by the numbers and clean. Throw the wrong switch, you are on kitchen patrol for a week. Too slow on the phase balance. Better get some nose plugs because you will be scrubbing the trash compactors until they sparkle. Drop a reading on the inducers and you'll find yourself shoveling out the animal pens until you smell like the south end of a northbound reek. Are we clear? Yes, chief, came the chorus of replies. Say again, I didn't hear you. Yes, chief. He smiled under the blast helmet, then grimaced as a rivulet of sweat ran into one eye. The milking headgear would be less than useless if the gun backfired, but it would make a dandy torture device for interrogating real spies. True, it was Navy policy that gunners wear them, but whoever designed these black buckets hadn't had to leave one on for a whole shift. They just made the job harder by restricting peripheral vision and essentially guaranteeing that you spent most of your shift clonking your head on pipes, struts, bulkheads, and the like. They were also hot and stuffy. Ten was pretty sure some boot had to design them for looks and not function. When nobody was around, he let the men take the helmets off and breathe a bit. But given the nature of this sim battery, some by-the-book officer was always dropping by to gawk. We have an order to commence primary ignition, he said. Commence now. He tapped the timer control and watched the seconds flick past as the chorus of reports began. Hypermatter reactor level 100%, feeds on tributaries 1 through 8, are clean. Primary power amplifier is online. Firing field amplifier is green. We are go on induction hyperphase generator feed. Tributary beam shaft fields in alignment. Targeting field generator is lit. Primary beam focusing magnet at full gauss. Ten watched the timer. So far, so good. But then... We have a hold on tributary 5. Repeat, we have orange on T5. Disharmonic in the subrouter. Fix it, mister, Ten said. He looked back at the timer. 24 seconds. Get it straight, right milking now. The sweating T5 tech tapped buttons, moved sliders, pivoted shift levers. Reharmonizing, the warble is flattening out in five, four, three, two... T5 is clean. We are go on T5. Ten scanned the board. The last orange light blinked off, and they were green straight across. He thumbed the safety button on the shifter above his head and pulled it down. Successful primary ignition achieved, the computer said. There was a cheer from the crew, and Ten smiled. 38 seconds. That's a new record, even with the glitch. But we can do better. He took off his helmet. Restart it. If we break 30 seconds before swing or third shift does, I'm buying the beer. They cheered and fell to work with a will. Once again, he smiled. Nothing seemed to motivate a crew like the lure of free beer. 37. Sim 7, Delta Sector, Death Star. Vil Dance was flying like a man possessed by an unfettered spirit. As well as he had ever piloted a TIE fighter, really sharp, he knew it. And it still wasn't good enough. No matter how he jinked or stalled or dipped, the attacker was right there behind him. He couldn't shake him. The other ship was like some impossible shadow, mimicking his every move. Vil did a power stall, but the bogey stayed right behind him as if he were welded to Vil's TIE. He rolled, went vertical, and the tail was still there. He hadn't fired a shot. Yet. All right, he muttered through clenched teeth. Let's burn some G's, my friend. 
He shoved the tie into an almost 90-degree break to starboard, nearly blacking out from the overpowering tug of gravity as he pulled at least four Gs. And the mysterious black fighter not only matched him, but made it look easy. Vil could almost hear his nemesis behind him yawning. If he could shake him loose long enough to turn, at least he might manage a last-ditch maneuver the pilots called a WBD. We both die. He'd take the son of a Rach with him. But it was too late for that. Abruptly, his pursuer's ion cannons flared. White light filled the cockpit, and as it blinded Vil, he heard, Your ship has been destroyed. The flight simulator's voice wasn't supposed to have any inflection, but Vil was sure he heard a smug, gotcha tone to it. Sam off, Vil said. He was disgusted with himself. The hollow projection winked out, and he leaned back in the control form chair and sighed. He'd thought, hoped, that the martial arts stuff he'd been studying would make a difference. After a couple of months' worth of classes, He'd felt as if he had been honed just a little sharper. And it was true, he'd realized when looking at the readouts. The timers had verified his reaction time. He was faster. But not fast enough to ace the simulator. Ever since the newbie Kendo had died over a month ago, Vil felt he'd been off his game. It wasn't anything dramatic. He could still outfly anyone else on the battle station, hands down but he still felt less than optimum. It hadn't been his fault. The kid had been reckless. He'd wound up chewing vacuum for it, and there was nothing Vil could have done. But he'd been one of Alpha Squadron, and as such, Vil felt responsible. He'd never had a death in his squad before. He felt that he should do something more than the obligatory memorial service, the expressions of grief to the family via hollow. But he had no idea what. It would have been one thing if Nand Kendo had died in the heat of battle, but to go out on so foolish a thing as a training exercise, it was so pointless. There were times, in fact, when the whole thing seemed pretty pointless to Vil, and these thoughts, these feelings, disturbed him, almost as much as the kid's death did. He'd signed up to be a fighter pilot for the Empire, had pictured himself rocketing through the cosmos, gunning down evildoers in the name of everything right in the galaxy. But so far, the only deaths he'd seen were those of a group of motley escaped convicts who'd stolen a shuttle. And a kid too cocky to live. It wasn't exactly how he'd visualized it. Time of fight? he asked. The computer said, Two minutes, fourteen seconds. Vil's eyebrows went up at that. It hadn't seemed that long during the fight. That was a personal best against the sim of Colonel Vindu Barvel, the only man who'd held his own for even a few breaths against Darth Vader. Vil wondered how he would fare against a sim of Vader. Not that he'd ever find out. He'd like to meet the fool crazy enough to ask the man in black to be scanned and hollowed while he pretended to pilot a tie. Like as not, Vader would take the man's head off with that fancy laser sword of his. Anyway, he'd held his own two seconds longer than he'd ever managed before. Maybe this hand-to-hand -hand stuff Steele was teaching had some merit after all. He felt a little better. Where do I rank overall? Of current duty Imperial pilots, you are currently ranked 19th in this simulation. Hmm. Out of how many? 234,612. Okay, so that wasn't too bad. Only 18 pilots ahead of him, out of nearly a quarter million? Certainly nothing to be ashamed of. Vil sighed. He leaned back in the form fit. Set it up again, he said. Beginning simulation in ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six. Vil took a deep breath and gripped the controls. Library and Archives, Deck 106, Death Star. Atur had been laboring over a data retrieval problem for nearly an hour when he realized that somebody was standing behind his chair. He frowned and turned, ready to chastise whoever it was for intruding into his office sanctuary. But the words died unspoken. Standing behind him, close enough to touch, was a droid, one of the new librarian models. 
He hadn't had a chance to see one before now, other than in hollow catalogs and sales material. It looked something like a standard bipedal protocol droid, save its color was a metallic blue instead of gold, complete with a bluish glow to its photoreceptors. The head was a bit larger also, reflecting its increased memory capacity. Yes. Good midday, sir. I've been ordered to report to you for assignment. What was that accent? High Coruscanti, it sounded like. Very posh and clipped. He'd never heard a droid affect an accent before, and the upper crust sensibility it conveyed made Atur hide a smile. In what capacity? Sir, I am a librarian. I'm here to assist you in whichever way you deem felicitous. Felicitous? Not a word that one usually heard from the vocabulator of a droid. Or anybody else, for that matter. Sometimes Atur thought he was the last classically educated man in the galaxy. Sent by whom? Sector Admiral Poteet, sir. I see, and your name? I am Model PRC-3. No, no, not your model number. Your name. I have no name, sir. The polished tone sounded somehow disapproving. I am a droid. Who programmed you? My primary programming was installed by Lord Alfred Chutes Beming, the owner and chief operating officer of Bibliotron Systems. Ah. On Imperial Center. Yes, sir. Again, the subtle subtext, which managed this time to imply, where else? Atur had, of course, heard of Lord Alpharon, the amateur inventor and heir to the Beming shipping fortune. The family owned one of the largest private libraries of hard copy books in the galaxy, more than seven million volumes, some ranging back to the Golden Age. Lord Alpharon was supposedly so rich that he could buy a planet, cover it knee-deep in precious jewels and metals, and then use the rumored doomsday weapon on this battle station to blow it all to atoms without putting a noticeable dent in his exchequer. He was also something of a tinkerer, and owned a droid design company where he spent much of his personal time. Atur thought wistfully of the rich man's library. There were people who would kill to work there, and he was foremost among them. Seven million books, he sighed. It made one's heart ache. All right, then. Henceforth you will answer to the name Percy, unless you have some objection. No objection, sir. Was the droid's tone slightly icier? Well, if so, that was just too bad. Good, Atur said. Now come here and make yourself useful. There is a bottleneck in this access system. Here. He pointed at the hollow screen. And I want it eliminated. Find a way. Very good, sir. Will that be all for now? That's enough, I imagine. How long do you estimate it will take? The droid stepped forward and touched several controls on the hollow console, then watched as a crawl of words and numbers scrolled up so fast that no human could possibly read them. After a few seconds, it touched a second control. The alphanumeric stopped, and the droid stood there silently. Atur counted slowly to five. You were going to give me an estimate of the time necessary to clear the bottleneck. Unnecessary, sir. The problem has been cleared. Atur blinked. Really? Of course, sir. Will there be anything else? Atur smiled. A competent assistant. How wonderful. Better a single droid that knew what it was doing than any number of fumbling organic beings. No, I think that will do for now. Thank you, Percy. I appreciate it. It is my function, sir. Would you care for some tea while you determine my next chore? I have checked the kitchen stores and can offer you a choice of Manelin Jasper, Kosh, Blue Fruit Kintel. Now a tour right and laughed aloud. Perhaps this post wouldn't be so onerous after all. 38. Docking Bay 35, Imperial Class Star Destroyer, Undauntable. Admiral Motti was pleased that Admiral Hela had done such a good job with the Undauntable. She was an old ship, on the line for a decade before any other in this quadrant, 
and despite that, she gleamed like a shiny new credit coin. All systems were in order, and Helaw, who was going to retire as soon as this project was finished, was old school, a man who had earned his flag rank on the front lines of a dozen major battles. When the guns started working, you wanted a man like him watching your back. He'd take the beam in his own chest before he allowed it to hit you from behind. As the two men walked down the corridor to the docking bay where Mati's lighter waited, their talk was easy and informal. They went way back. Helaw had been a captain on the Ion Storm when Mati had gotten his promotion to first lieutenant. That Mati had eventually done a desk tour on Imperial Center and made contacts that allowed him to rise past his old commander, spoke to his ambition and intelligence in such matters. Helaw had never enjoyed politics, even though Mati had tried to interest him. The older man just didn't care. All he wanted to do was take his ship out and smoke the enemy, and he was as good at it as any man in the Navy. Assigning him a desk would have been a waste, Mati knew, even though he would have been a formidable moth had he wanted to go down that road. Better by far than Tarkin, whose political skills were superior to Mati's own, but whose grasp of working strategy and tactics was much inferior to Helaw's. So you think this big tank of a station Will Huff is building is coming along all right? It is, and now that I'm aboard, it will do so even faster. Helaw laughed. Never a lack of self-confidence in you, Zai. Mati smiled in return. You know what they say. Sometimes wrong, but never in doubt. I still think it's putting too many spawns in one bin. Come on, Hyam. You've seen the specs, even though you weren't supposed to. The station is a fortress. It has more guns than a fleet and a weapon that will crack open worlds like they were ripe wooly nuts. Nothing the rebels can throw at it will slow it down by as much as a meter. Nothing we have will give it pause. Whatever else he might be, Wilhuff's ideas about this are solid. The rebels won't be able to run fast enough. And if we can blow a planet out from under them, where can they hide? Maybe. They were almost to the deck. Motti turned to look at his old commander. Maybe. Did I ever tell you about Lieutenant Pojo? I don't think so. Thirty-five, forty years back. Can Pojo was the range officer and small arms instructor on the training ship Overt. He was fleet champion with any arms you could carry. Carbine, sniper rifle, sidearm. He could use a blast pistol to pick flies off a wall at ten paces. I never saw a man who could shoot as well as he did. It was uncanny. Uh-huh. Motti resisted the urge to yawn. He admired and respected Hyam Helaw, as he did few men. But the old trooper did take his time spinning a yarn. We ran into a bit of trouble in the Vergesso. Pirates had taken over a moon. We were sent down to teach them the error of their ways. Motti nodded. And? Pojo wanted to get into the fray. He was a lot of close quarters stuff. The only city on the moon was domed. We're talking a maze of alleys and narrow streets. Nobody could use big guns because anything larger than a blaster rifle might rupture the dome. So the CO thought, why not? I was doing a tour as a naval adjunct, a second loot, and Pojo was assigned to our squad. So we drop, access the dome, and start hunting pirates. They were a ratty bunch, maybe a hundred, hundred and twenty of them, but spread out. Our squad came across a group of them, about 25 men, and we all commenced to have a shootout. Pojo was knocking them down left, right, and center like targets on the range. Only thing I've ever seen to compare it to is that old hollow of Fao Ji taking out the mercenaries. Ever seen it? Mati nodded. What soldier hadn't? So Pojo takes out half the group before any of us can even crank up our guns, using nothing but his sidearm a blaster modified with a heavy-duty capacitor to fire more charges than your standard model. The survivors broke and ran, and we started chasing them. Pojo and I took off after a group of four, three men and a Rodian, I think. Pojo's grinning like an overfed sand cap. This was what he was born to do. The pirates couldn't shoot for sour wool poop, so they split up. I took off after the first two, and they shot their guns dry, at which time I planked them. Then I circled back to Pojo. He had the last two cornered. They had drained their blasters, and he had holstered his. He holstered his blaster? Yeah, to give them a chance. They were six, eight meters away. So Pojo says, 
Okay, boys, here's the deal. Take off, and if I miss you, you're free. Mati shook his head. Unfripping believable. So, the two, figuring they're dead man anyway, charge him. Pojo pulls that customized blaster faster than you can believe. His hand, the gun, they were just a blur. Those guys hadn't taken two steps. He cooks off around and shoots the solder on the left right between the eyes. Zap. Then he aims at the second pirate, who's still running at him, and squeezes off another bolt. Let me guess. He missed. Nope. Blaster shorted out. Hiss, pop, crackle. The capacitor must have overloaded and the gun flared. Pojo drops it, goes for his backup. No gunnery loot would carry just the one gun. But by that time, the pirate was in his face. Sauter had a shiv. Just a low-tech blade, not even a vibro. One step above a flint knife. By the time I lined up and shot the pirate, he'd buried that knife in Pojo's throat. The medics couldn't get there in time. Motti smiled. A multi-billion credit battle station is not exactly a Piger-rigged blaster, Admiral. The more complex a weapon, the more likely it is to have flaws, he law said. Khan Pojo was the best pistolier I ever saw, then or since. But he was waxed by what was essentially a whittled rock when his state-of-the-art weapon failed. I'm not too worried about pirates with knives, I am. You should be, son, the grizzled old admiral said. You should be worried about everything. Admiral Motti's lighter, 200 kilometers off Undauntable's port stern. Did the old man have a valid point? Motti wondered. It was hard to see how. The Death Star was a true dreadnought, a giant among midgets. Of course, just about every fable about giants tended to end with the midgets triumphing somehow. Perhaps it wouldn't be a bad idea, once he was back on board, to order a detailed inspection of the superstructure and the plans. Maintenance would howl, but that didn't matter. After all, Mati hadn't gotten to his rank by assuming everything was as it should be. Like as not, the old man was just being paranoid. But in situations like these, with the fate of the galaxy literally riding on the outcome, it was hard to be too paranoid. Motti was still musing about Helaw's story when the Star Destroyer Undauntable suddenly ceased to be the oldest ship of the line in the quadrant behind him. In a brilliant, silent, white-hot blast, the Undauntable blew apart. 39. Command Deck, Overbridge, Death Star. You were there, Tarkin said. I didn't blow it up, Motti replied. Tarkin silently counted to ten. Behind him at a discreet distance, Dela stood, pretending not to hear their conversation. What could have happened? It could have been an accident, Motti said. You don't really think that? No more than you do, sir. Admiral Helaw was as good as any commander in the Imperial Navy and better than most. I cannot imagine an accident of this magnitude would happen on a ship he ran. The Undauntable was an old ship, even so. Tarkin nodded. I'm afraid I agree, he paused. It would be better if it had been an accident. Motti said nothing, but Tarkin knew the man was no fool. He understood. Darth Vader's recent visit was supposed to have eliminated the threat of sabotage. Tarkin continued. So I understand. Apparently it did not. If that is the case, we could, I expect, depend on another visit from Vader in short order. Not the worst thing that could happen to us, but certainly another burden we don't need, with sprawl construction nearly complete. One would expect such a visit, yes. Whereas if there was an accident on an old ship, a leaky hypermatter containment valve, perhaps, that would be unfortunate but understandable and there would be no need for the Emperor's representative to come all the way out here again? Motti frowned deeper. It would be a shame, however, for such an accident to be laid at the feet of Hyam Helaw, whose memory would forever bear that blot on his otherwise perfect record. It would be a shame. However, with Hyam dead, that won't really bother him, will it? And he had no family. Motti said the Navy was his family. Just so and Hyam was loyal to the bone. He would not wish his family to suffer, would he? Motti didn't like it, that was plain. But Motti was also a loyalist. 
There was no need for Tarkin to remind him of his duty. The Admiral nodded, a crisp, military motion. So then, an unfortunate accident and a single black mark on an otherwise brilliant career. Unfortunate indeed, Tarkin replied. And we all move on. After Motti was gone, Dela moved over to stand next to Tarkin. Isn't this a bit risky? Not really. Motti is ambitious and he knows this station is his transport to greatness. He'll be promoted to Moff as soon as the rebels are vanquished, and it would be foolish for him to raise a fuss about this. He liked the old man. I was rather fond of him myself. But nothing we can say or do will bring him back, and better that his death serves us, rather than gets in our way. So it was a terrible accident. These things happen. She nodded. But that doesn't solve the problem entirely, does it? He sighed. You are quite right, Admiral. We still have among us a traitor, who somehow managed to vaporize a Star Destroyer. We need to find the ones responsible before the rebels can claim credit for this heinous action. And by we, I mean me, she finished. Do you think that wise? I should be getting back to my duties at the mall. They will keep. I need you here more than they do there. Dela nodded. Well, I suppose that if it is my duty, what else is to be done? She smiled. He returned it. I'll start immediately, she said. Tarkin cleared his throat. Perhaps not immediately. I seem to recall there were some other matters we intended to discuss. In the privacy of your quarters? He smiled again. Just so. The Hard Heart Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. Tila Cars wasn't much of a drinker. Sure, she'd have a little wine with dinner, a social drink now and then, but she was too happy a drunk, too willing to go along with whatever anybody wanted just for the fun of it, and that had gotten her in trouble more than a couple of times. Better to stay sober than to have to deal with the regrets later. She had enough of those as it was. But here she was in this cantina, listening to a young woman on the small stage playing a stringed instrument, something classical and quiet, barely audible over the sounds of people drinking, laughing, and talking. She was here because she had won a bet. One of the other architects had doubted her ability to redesign a dining hall to a specification change suddenly required because somebody had mistranslated a measurement system. Whereas the spec said the room's floor was to be 900 square meters, Whoever had written the blueprint had somehow used the Trogan meter instead of the Imperial Standard meter, and the difference could not be made to fit in the available space, since there was a 25% variation in the measures. Back when she had been in school, such an error would have been unthinkable. But the relationship of academe to real construction was that of night to day. It happened all the time. Just last week, an automated supply ship had plowed into a warehouse on despair, destroying the ship entirely and half the building it hit, because somebody had set the autopilot's deceleration speed to centimeters per second instead of meters. If you impact at a hundred times the velocity you're supposed to, it makes something of a difference. Vishner, the architect who had proposed the bet, lifted his cup in salute, as did the other five people from her work group, and she raised her own cup in acknowledgment. A noisy group entered the cantina just then, drowning out whatever toast Vishner had to offer along with the music. Tila looked at the new arrivals, half a dozen human males, all dressed in pilots informals. She sipped a tiny bit of her drink and put the cup down. The pilots were loud, full of themselves, oozing over confidence and arrogance. She had dated a former military pilot once, who'd left the service and taken a job flying commercial transports on her homeworld. But he hadn't left the attitude behind. Look at me, it said. I'm so much better than everybody else. I can fly. That relationship hadn't lasted long. Being secure in what you did was a good thing. But being obnoxious about it? Not so much. The pilots took a table, and a droid went over to take their orders. Tila surreptitiously glanced at her chrono. She had to stay for a while more just to be polite, but since she wasn't much for small talk, 
Mostly she'd just sit there and smile and nurse her drink until she could make an excuse and take off. She had some journals she wanted to read, and crowded, noisy rooms had never been her favorite spaces. She needed to go to the refresher, though, and while she preferred to do that in her own cube, when you had to go, you had to go. She smiled, stood, and worked her way toward the fresher. She was on her way back to her table, when a large fellow wearing storage worker's greens decided he would give her an opportunity to enjoy his company. The man lurched to his feet and blocked her path. Hey, sweet look, what's your hurry? Let me buy you a drink. He was at least half-soused from the smell of his breath and his unsteady motion. Thank you, but I already have a drink. I need to get back to my friends there. Tila nodded at her table four meters past where the storage men wavered on unsteady feet. Ah, nah, you'll have much more fun here at my table, Strew. He belched, and a rum-tainted miasma drifted past her nostrils. Tila was aware that she was not altogether unattractive, and over the years since puberty had resculpted her body, she had learned how to deal with unwanted attention well enough. Sometimes you could smile them away. Sometimes you put a little steel in your voice, and most times you just flat out told them you weren't interested. Drunks didn't always get the subtle hints, so she went for direct. Sorry, not interested. She moved to go around him. He slid over and kept her route blocked. You don't know what you're missing, sweet look. I'm prime. Good for you. Tell somebody who cares. She turned, intending to go back the way she'd come and loop around. He grabbed her wrist as she started away. You saying no to me? His tone was definitely less friendly now. Tila twisted her wrist, trying to pull free, knowing in advance that it would only serve to make the storage man hang on tighter. But she was right. Conversation at the tables immediately surrounding them lagged, as the patrons, mostly male, and mostly as drunk as or drunker than her aspiring boyfriend, watched in bleary interest. The storage man was as large as he was drunk, which made him quite formidable. Tila stopped struggling, because at this stage, that was what her assailant wanted. She had heard that the cantina's bouncer was fast and reliable. She hoped so, because she knew from past experience how quickly a situation like this could get really ugly. Oh, look, a man's voice said. Tila turned. It was one of the pilots. He looked about twenty-five. And he also looked like, if he worked out hard and ate his flakies every morning, he might someday have a chest as big as the storage man's neck. Great, she thought, a hero. Where's the fripping bouncer? Your shin hurts, the flyboy continued, smiling at the big drunk as guilelessly as a freshly decanted clone. The storage man frowned. My what? The pilot kicked a short, low move, and the inside edge of his boot sole impacted the bigger man's lower leg just below the knee. He scraped his foot down the bigger man's leg and stomped on the storage man's instep. Ow! Feek! The pilot put his right hand on the big drunk's chest and shoved. Since the other was hopping on one foot, clutching his insulted leg and yelling, it took very little effort to move him backward, where he sat down heavily into his seat. Before he could do more than blink in bleary surprise, a very large man appeared as if by magic directly behind the storage man and laid a hand the size of a wampus forepaw on the seated man's shoulder. Is there a problem here? He asked in a quiet voice. It was a pleasant voice with no anger in it, but it nevertheless made Tila think of a sheath covering a razor's edge. Nope, the pilot said. Our friend here is a little over his limit and felt unsteady on his feet. The lady and I were just helping him regain his seat safely. The bouncer, standing behind the storage man, smiled. Ah. Well, then, enjoy the rest of your evening. He looked down at the befuddled storage man. And you were just leaving, weren't you? What? Nicely put. Let me help you to the exit. When they were gone, Tila said to the pilot, I don't want to seem ungracious, but that wasn't necessary. When a man lays unwanted hands on a woman, I believe it is. It's discourteous at best, brutality at worst. He smiled. 
I'm Lieutenant Vildance, by the way. She had to admit that his smile was attractive. Down, girl, she cautioned herself. But despite that, she couldn't deny the tingling that had started in her stomach. Tila Cars, she replied. And I appreciate the sentiment, Lieutenant, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. Appreciation, even without agreement, is certainly better than a poke in the eye. Would you allow me to buy you a drink? Thanks, but no. I'm not much of a drinker. Me neither, really. I'd rather be in my cube studying technical journals. Really? He grinned again. Actually, no, but I'm hoping that if you believe I'm the serious sort, maybe you'll think better of me. His smile was infectious. Tila couldn't help smiling in return. Does that work for you often? Pretending to be studious? No, pretending to give away your pickup line that way. Now he laughed. Oh, I like a smart and funny femme. He dimmed the smile a little. Let me buy you a calf or sucosa. Water, even. Sit and visit with me for a little while. I don't know. Which was a lie. She knew very well what she wanted to do. In her mind's eye, the small mental projection of her conscience and common sense gaped in disbelief. I can't believe you're seriously contemplating this, it scolded. Come on, it's war. I'm a pilot. My number could be up any moment. Wouldn't you feel better knowing I went out to meet my aunt smiling at the memory of you? You just barely escaped a dangerous situation with one man, her conscience avatar said, and here you are letting yourself be sugar-talked by another. Tila laughed at Dance's line. You pilots and your platinum tongues. All right, I suppose it won't hurt anything. Her conscience threw up its hands in resignation and stalked off into the gray corridors of her brain. As they approached the table, she saw the other pilots look at them. More than a few looked twice, or closer, and all were blatantly impressed. They stood. Hey, Vil, one of them said. We have to shove off. See you back at the barracks? Dance eyed him. You're sure about that? Oh, right. Um. The flyer was obviously uncomfortable, and the concealed smiles of the others, not to mention the glare he was getting from Dance, weren't making things any easier for him. Right. We have to, uh, go over our technical specs down in the hangar. The five pilots left. Tila gave Dance a measured look. You had a bet going with your friends, she said. It was not a question. He shrugged. Of course. First man back with a woman wins the table. They'll go see if the odds in the pub on level six are better. One doesn't need a bunch of comrades cramping his run if one gets lucky. You aren't going to get that lucky, Lieutenant. Not tonight, anyway. He flashed that high wattage smile at her again. You're too sharp for me, Tila Cars. I really like a woman who makes me have to stretch. She sighed. No way was she getting into anything remotely serious with a Navy pilot. No way but a cup of calf couldn't hurt. 40. The Hard Heart Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. Mima Ruthis was aware that she was, well, not to put too fine a point on it, primping. That was a bad sign, she knew, when she started to care what a new male thought of her appearance. The actions themselves didn't look like much, a slight adjustment of her posture, a little brush over the brow to smooth out a bit of makeup, a quick glance at her reflection when she passed a mirror to check her leku positions. Nothing major. But she knew. She wanted to look good, and she wanted Ratua to notice that she did. She wasn't too old, ugly, or fat. And she wasn't stupid. He already did like her. You didn't run cantinas for as long as she had without being able to feel the heat come off a male when he looked at you. Still, the fluttery sensation she felt, the quickening of her heartbeat and breath, those were all bad signs. She didn't need a new complication in her life right now. And Green Eyes was definitely that. For one thing, he didn't exist, according to what Roto had found, or hadn't found, in his hollow net search. And that meant he was a bad boy of some kind. 
Could be a legal bad boy, a Sub Rosa agent for the Empire, say. Or he could be a rebel spy. Or some kind of criminal. But he made her laugh. He was quick and clever. And those eyes? She'd never seen any quite that color before. They were like liquid emerald, bright and alert. Hence the primping. At the end of the bar, a pair of CPOs were talking about a rumored prison break in the detention area. Mima overheard one of them say, Way I heard it, nine guys broke out, one of them a Jedi. The other petty officer laughed. Hate to point it out, but Jedi are real scarce these days. Just telling the story, Ten. Yeah, I heard it too. Only I heard it was fifty guys, all captured rebels, led by five Jedi, and they took over the super laser and started blasting star destroyers. Of course, the big gun isn't even operational yet. Anyone knows that, it's me. But hey, why let facts get in the way of a good story? The first chief laughed and sipped at his ale. Sounds almost like a sim run, don't it? A real wacky sim run. The second CPO said, Time this war's over, want to bet that story will have a rebel army nearly destroying the station? Every action I ever been in, stories like that pop up. One flube spits on the sidewalk. By the end of the cycle, it's turned into a crack unit of rebels knocking over a fortress. The first one laughed again. Yeah, next they'll be saying it took the 501st to put him down. Both men laughed. Mima smiled. She had heard some of those stories, too. Why people felt the need to embellish the truth, or even fabricate something completely different, when reality was all too often quite fantastic enough was light years beyond her. She happened to be looking at the door when Ratua came ambling in as if he owned the place. He caught her glance, smiled, and headed for the bar. Once there, he looked her up and down in frank appreciation. You, he said to her, look like the reason the riot started. She realized to her astonishment that she was blushing. Well, she replied, you look like you could use a drink. What'll it be? He laughed. I'll have the usual. Which means what exactly? Surprise me, something exotic. Expensive enough to justify me sitting here and occupying your bar and attention? I don't think we have anything worth that much. You wound me right here. He put a hand over his heart, or at least where a human's heart would be. Here I am, seeking sanctuary, trying to stay out of trouble. Mima said, I think you are trouble, Ratua. It would probably be much better for me if I stayed as far away from you as I could. Probably, he agreed in a more serious tone. But where's the fun in that? She built him a drink, a simple one with a lot of alcohol and some sweeteners and colors. It was potent stuff. So far she'd never seen him drunk, at least not so she could tell. Must have a hyperdrive metabolism, she thought. She put down his glass, then planted both hands on the pleak wood bar and leaned toward him. Fun starts with the truth. Who are you? He sighed and didn't say anything for a couple of seconds. I've always found truth to be highly overrated. Nevertheless, okay. He took a fortifying swig of his drink, then said, I'm Salat Ratua Dill second son of the first counselor, Nagat Karas Ratua, and his tertiary wife, Fila Darren. Of late, I resided on the planet Despair, where I was incarcerated for a crime I actually did not commit. Though, in balance, I can't claim to be an upstanding citizen. So you weren't kidding before? Nope. What was the crime? Guilt by association? Wrong place, wrong time. And how did you come to be here? I escaped. Really, just like that? Well, I won't bore you with the details. Oh, please, bore me. I so seldom find myself bored these days. It doesn't bother you that I'm an escapee? Mima stood back and folded her arms. You were pretty sure it wouldn't, weren't you? Or you wouldn't have told me. I was hoping. And you did demand the truth. So I did. And I'm wondering when I'm going to get it. Ratua studied the drink for a moment, then looked up at her, and she had to physically tense up to resist the earnestness in those remarkable eyes. 
now, if you want it. What have you done for which you might have deserved to be imprisoned? I was a smuggler, among other things. Nothing violent. That's good. She refilled his drink. He smiled into it, then at her. Smile and use those eyes as much as you want, she thought. If I have to turn you in, I will. Think hard before you say anything more, Selat Ratchuadil. If you're guilty of any crimes against the Empire, then I could be endangering my cantina just by talking to you. You might want to turn around and walk out of here right now, because if your presence is a danger to me and my livelihood, you'll find out where this place got its name. He stared at her. I believe you're the kind of person who'd do it. Mima nodded. That I am. Good, said Ratua. If you weren't, I wouldn't be talking to you. 41. Rec Room 17A, Death Star. Sergeant Nova Steele was tired. The fighting classes he taught weren't part of his regular duties, and now that word had gotten around, he had four full sessions, with about 25 students per class. Each of these ran an hour and a half, and he had two sessions every evening after his shift ended. He didn't eat until after the second class, after which he would go back to his cube, shower, and hit the sleep pad. Such a schedule made for busy light and dark cycles. He kept himself in shape, but he hadn't been sleeping well. The bad dreams he'd sometimes had back on the prison planet had grown more frequent on the battle station, and some of them were extremely realistic and violent. More than a few times he'd come out of a sleep to find his heart pounding rapidly and his coverlets drenched in sweat. He didn't understand why it was happening. He had considered having medical run a check to make sure there wasn't something amiss going on in his brain, but he kept hoping the sleep sorties would ease off. He'd give it a little more time, and then he would go see the medics, he told himself. Maybe there was something in the air, some trace element the filters weren't straining out. Besides, when did he have time to go see a doctor? Most of the students were rank beginners. Even though some of them could fight well enough, they had to learn the system of Terras Cassi to overlay what they already knew. There were reasoned patterns of movement, principles, laws, and these were more important than any particular technique. It didn't matter if you had a punch that would knock down a wall, if you couldn't deliver it, and to do that, you needed a system that would allow it frequently. Even though his students were newbies, Nova always felt as if he learned as much from them as he taught. If you had to explain something to a being who knew nothing about it, you had to understand it pretty well. Sometimes words would come out of his mouth that he didn't expect, words that suddenly rang in a way that the essential truth just blossomed suddenly, like a desert flower after a sudden rain. Now and again, he himself couldn't believe some of the things he'd said. Where had that come from? He hadn't known it was there until he'd heard himself say it. He realized that someone was standing before where he sat, cross-legged on the matted floor. Devo, you had a question? The student, a squat power lifter who looked strong enough to pick himself up with one hand, nodded. Yeah, Sarge, that distance thing. I'm a little confused. Usually there was one student who asked most of the questions, and while the others would sometimes cut their gazes to the ceiling and look bored, the questioner was usually speaking for more than just him or herself. That was why Nova always answered questions as completely as time allowed. Bear hand to hand. There are four ranges, he said. He counted them off on his fingers. Kicking, punching, elbowing, grappling. You can't grapple effectively at elbow range. You can't elbow at punching range, and you can't punch at kicking range. Add impact weapons and you alter the distances. A cane extends your punch to kicking range. A knife extends your elbow to punching range. Sodder has a knife in his hand. You don't want him closer than a step and a half unless you're doing something active to him. Inside that, he's too close. He'll get you with that blade more often than not. And it only takes one time to ruin your day. So... Let me show you the step in to steal that crucial distance again. The drills went on. The students practiced the moves with Nova walking around, making corrections, offering direction, 
telling them when they had it wrong and when they had it right. He liked to think he was an encouraging teacher. He always seemed to develop a core of regulars, even though turnover among newbies was usually pretty good. A lot of folks wanted to be able to kill someone with their bare hands, but they didn't want to do the months or years of work necessary to develop the skills. The air in the rec room seemed to change, suddenly and subtly. Nova could feel it without having to look around. Danger had entered the room. Without making it obvious, as he helped a student find the proper hand position for a punch, he turned slightly. Standing just inside the door was Rodo, the bouncer from the hard heart. Nova grinned slightly and caught the other's grin in return. The class would be over in five minutes, and he knew Rodo's timing wasn't an accident. His smile became wider, as well as slightly rueful. He was tired, he was hungry, and he hadn't been expecting it. But that's how it always went, wasn't it? Those were the conditions one trained for. He'd gotten his first-level adept after a grueling two-hour class that had involved a lot of groundwork, athletic rolling around and grappling. That kind of stuff wore you out pretty quickly. His master had waited until the class was over and the students headed for the sonic showers when he'd pulled Nova aside. I think it's time you took the test, he'd said. The sudden adrenaline rush had gripped Nova, briefly washing away his fatigue. Really? When? Right now. Nova smiled at the memory. The test had taken almost four hours. The old man had turned him upside down and inside out. He'd taken him apart like a malfunctioning droid. And he'd been right to do so. After all, a footpad on the street wasn't going to wait until you felt your best. You had to be ready at any moment to fight to the death if necessary. Otherwise, the teachings weren't worth knowing. At the end of the session, Nova dismissed his students, many of whom were obviously wondering what the hard hearts bouncer was doing here. Nova moved over to where Rodo was holding up the wall. He's big enough to hold it up, he thought. Might as well get to it. He wasn't getting any less tired. He said, So, you want to go a couple of rounds? Rodo shrugged, his shoulders shifting like tectonic plates. I wouldn't mind. Of course, if dancing with your charity cases has tired you out. Thanks for your concern. Light spar? Rodo nodded. Fine by me. Back when Nova had been a beginner, there had been two kinds of sparring matches generally allowed. Heavy sparring required the donning of bulky, padded biogel suits. Even though the gel was relatively lightweight, it added five kilos to you at minimum, not to mention slowing reaction time and reducing range of movement considerably. A suited-up attacker charging you could shrug off a strike that would deck an unprotected fighter and keep coming. Early on in his training, Nova learned to answer the question, light or heavy sparring, with the former. Of course, the only difference in the two was the suit. You hit just as hard in light sparring, but since you knew you could get seriously damaged if you made a mistake, you were more careful. Nova closed the door and latched it. You need to warm up? Rodo shook his head. Nah. You need a nap? Nova shook his head and grinned. He walked to the center of the padded room and turned to face Rodo. Teres Cassie had half a dozen basic stances, and Nova was comfortable with them all, having practiced them thousands of times. But as Rodo ambled toward him, he didn't shift his feet into one of the TK defensive plants. He stayed in a neutral pose, shoulders relaxed, feet about shoulder width apart, his left foot a hair ahead of his right. No point in giving his opponent any clues as to his style until the fight began. Nova knew he was starting at a disadvantage, even beyond his being tired. There was the simple fact that Rodo outmassed him by a good twenty kilos and stood almost a head taller. Everything else being equal, and so far Nova had seen nothing to indicate that Rodo's fighting skills were better than his own. The advantage always lay with the bigger man. But Rodo didn't know about Nova's blink. That probably made them even. Probably. Rodo stopped just outside his own step and a half, slightly longer than Nova's range. A two-step position was too far to attack. The defender would have plenty of time to get set. A single step was too close. Nova held his ground. Rodo circled to his left. 
Nova turned, shifting slightly his weight on the balls of his feet and pivoting on both incrementally. He bent his knees a bit, sinking a little lower. Rodo moved his hands, circling to a high-low, left-over-right position, pulled them in closer to his body, leaned away a hair, and stole half a step closer. It was a good fake. That upper body motion would make you think Roto had moved back, when, in fact, he had moved in. Nova stepped off neutral to a side stance and used the angle to steal back the half step, maintaining their distance. Roto nodded. Nice, he said. Nova did a back crossover step, right foot behind the left, giving Roto what looked like an unbalanced and awkward target. The bigger man shook his head. Maybe not. Nova circled to his left, stopped, and pivoted, putting his left side forward at about 45 degrees. Roto mirrored the move and dropped his center of gravity a couple of centimeters. Since he was taller, if Nova got to his attack range, Roto would already be there. The bouncer was a big man, and that no doubt tended to favor him in distance fighting, but he also worked in a cantina where encounters would be close. Rodo began to sway ever so slightly, turning his hips. Nova repressed a smile. Did the other man think he could be lulled like a ricky tick facing a naga? He couldn't be fooled that easily. He knew that if he grappled with a guy that much bigger and stronger than him, he'd have to have angle, leverage, and a base, or he'd lose. That wasn't a matter of skill so much as it was simple physics. Rodo charged, and Nova barely got out of the way in time. He cursed himself for a fool, even as he dropped and did a fast leg sweep. He'd lost focus for just an instant, and that's all it had taken to almost lose the match. If it weren't for his ability to sense another's moves, Roto would have had him. The big man was fast. Their shins connected, smacking together like boards. But Roto was more flexible than he appeared. He jumped, foiling the sweep, but having to step far enough out in doing so that he couldn't punch in passing. Nova did a stutter step, broke it short, and got within range. He went in with a triple punch, high, low, high. There was no way to block all three. But Roto didn't back up. Instead, he stepped in and threw a horizontal elbow strike. Nova sensed that one coming before Roto started it, blocked with an open hand, and tried a lock. Roto countered with one of his own, stepped out, and turned. And they were back where they started. Roto chuckled. And in a moment, it turned into a laugh, and Nova joined him. Both men straightened from their fighting crouches and relaxed. The actual fighting time, Nova estimated as 30 seconds or less. We done, Roto said. I think so, Nova said. No point really in continuing. They were too evenly matched. There was no alpha male here. You have some outstanding moves, friend, he told the bouncer. You know, the bigger man said. He extended his hand, as did Nova. Where'd you get that hip fake? Nova asked. Chunga bush fighting. What about that sweep? That's not classical, Teras Kasi. Sarah Plink, Jalanese knife. Rodo nodded. They had given each other new moves, a valuable exchange. Nova realized that his tiredness was gone. He hadn't had a chance to play with a fighter this good in years. It was rare these days to run into someone skilled enough to learn from. You ever see any veterinarian boxing? He asked. Yeah, the cross-cut version. Used to know a guy had some of that. Hard to get the moves down when you've only got two arms, but... He shrugged. Gotta get back to work. Come on along, drinks are on me. This, Nova told himself, could be the start of a great friendship. 42. Architectural Office Suite, Executive Level, Death Star. Tila Cars blinked at the man in front of her. Where's the Wookiee chief? Harinya? He took sick, the man said. Had to go to the clinic. Isn't well enough to come back to work yet. I'm push rotting this shift. And it was your idea to build this exhaust port? She gestured at the expanded hollow of the station's plans. The much-debated port near the north pole of the Meridian Trench was clearly visible. No, it wasn't my idea. It's on the plans. I talked to the Wookiee about that. 
The man, a gray beard who was a handspan shorter and fifty kilos heavier than she was, shrugged. Yeah? Well, sorry, but what you told him didn't get passed on. The plans called for an exhaust port, and that's what they pay me to do. Follow the plans. Unless you, uh, maybe got an exception and wrote it down? Disgusted with herself, Tila shook her head. I didn't have a chance to get to it. He shrugged again. Not my fault. She nodded. That was true. It wasn't his fault. Okay, she said. Done is done. What about the heat exchangers on the barracks levels? 98% complete, down to routers and capacitors, and we'll have those online in a couple more shifts, no problem. That much was good anyway. The walkway escalators from six to seven? Done, we can crank them anytime. And the pocket park on nine is where? Laid out, greensward all seeded, the big trees and foliage planted, pumps and pipes installed, and the channels and ponds, cast and hard set. All we need is for hydrology to deliver the water and power to light it up. Tila looked at her data log. Everything was coming along on time. And some things, like the tiny patch of greenery up on nine, were actually ahead of schedule. Harinyar's substitute was certainly keeping the Wookiee's rep spotless. Okay, so they'd put in a heat exhaust port that wasn't really needed. It hadn't slowed down anything else. And it certainly wouldn't hurt anything by being there. In fact, given the size of the reactor and the heat it would generate at full power, it was probably better to have too many vents than too few. It was always a good idea to err on the side of safety. All right, she said. Just keep me in the circuit. Of course. After he left her office, Tila looked over the schedule again. Her portion of the construction was on time and on budget, true enough but she wasn't the only architect on the project, and as it sometimes happened, the good suffered for the faults of the bad. She expected a call from her boss any time now, telling her she was going to have to cut costs or speed up, or both. It wasn't fair or right, but if you could carry your load, then you were often asked to help somebody else carry theirs. Tila Cars? Tila looked up. Her receptionist droid stood in the doorway of her office. Yes. Senior Project Manager Steinex sends his regards and asks that you come by his office at your convenience. Tila nodded. Well, there it was, just like she expected. Inform the senior PM I'll be by in an hour if that's okay with him. There was no help for it. That was how things worked. She noticed the droid was still there. What? You have a call incoming from a Lieutenant Villian Dance. Tila grinned. Put that through and close the door on your way out. Despite her resolve, the dashing Thai pilot had charmed her. He was funny, clever, and not bad looking. Given her job and trustee status, it wasn't as though she had much time for recreation, and a man who made her laugh was worth something. Her view screen blossomed with the image of Vil Dance. He tossed her a jaunty salute, two fingers off his brow. Good shift, Lady Tila, she smiled. Not too bad so far, Lieutenant. I hope your own is going well. It just improved a thousand percent. Smooth, she thought, as smooth as the surface of a neutron star. To what do I owe the honor of this call? Ah, well, as it happens... I know somebody who knows somebody who is a friend of the cook in the new Melanie's restaurant that just opened on the rec deck food court. You fancy faux doux and green fire sauce? One of my favorites. I thought maybe you'd like spicy food. I can get us a table swing shift. My treat. How can a lieutenant afford such exotic cuisine? I hear it's very expensive to eat there. He gave her a disarming shrug. Not a lot to burn credits on out here, he said. And since at any moment I might be leaving on a mission from which I won't return, I figure might as well spend the money on something, someone, worthwhile. She laughed. How long are you going to milk that particular routine? I can see I'll have to try something else since you are a cold-hearted femme unaffected by the prospect of my possible demise. So, dinner? 
She could see her conscience in her mind's eye shaking its head. You'll be sorry. Space it, she told her inner self. Well, I do have to eat, she said aloud. What time? He flashed her that gigawatt smile. Nineteen hundred? I'll meet you there. Just made my day, Tila. We do what we can to keep the troops happy. After they disconnected, she leaned back in her chair, feeling somewhat bemused with herself. Nothing would come of any liaison between them, not in the long term. He was a pilot, and despite his ironic bravado, likely to get blown out of the vacuum sooner or later. And she was a prisoner, who might get some consideration after the station was built. But there were no guarantees there, either. Still, there was a war going on, and you had to take your joys where you could find them. When built, this battle station would be weapon-proof, and she might be allowed to stay on assignment after the basic design was finished, perhaps even after this thing was ready to roll out and over any resistance in its way. There would still be changes, both in design and construction, taking place. The fact that she was working for the enemy still troubled her occasionally, but she'd rationalized it away for the most part. And anyway, a job and a place to sleep weren't the only considerations in a woman's life. It was better in the present circumstances to take it one day at a time and enjoy each as best she could. And Lieutenant Phil Dance sounded like he knew how to make life enjoyable. Main corridor, outside the Hard Heart Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. This new deal he had in mind, if he pulled it off, would leave Ratchua sitting very pretty indeed. It was technically illegal, which was moot, because given his situation, everything he did was technically illegal. But in this case, nobody would come to any harm. The Empire was pouring credits into this project like water onto a forest fire. A few buckets here and there wouldn't be missed. And what was beneath their notice would fix things so he wouldn't have to work for a while. He was feeling pretty good all in all as he walked confidently down the gently curving corridor toward the recreation area. He mulled over his plans on his way to see Mima Ruthis, the most beautiful and interesting female he had run across in, well, forever. The cantina was just ahead, up the corridor a hundred meters or so, when the bouncer Rodo emerged. Ratchua started to call out and wave, but then, half a step behind Rodo, a second man exited the cantina. It took him a second to place the second fellow, the context and surroundings being utterly different from where Ratchua had last encountered him. When he did, a chill washed over him like a splash of liquid nitrogen. It was Sergeant Nova Steele, the same man for whom he'd sometimes participated in martial arts demonstrations back in Slashtown. Without missing a step, Ratchua turned into the next doorway, a shop featuring femware, resisting the urge to kick in the afterburner. He pretended to peruse the racks of selections and gaze at the hollow mannequins. As he did, he could feel fear roiling in his belly like one of the Dianoga rumored to infest down levels. Steele was a decent man, but there was no doubt where his loyalties lay, and it wasn't with escaped prisoners. A droid rolled up, gyroscopically balanced on a single wheel. How may I assist you, sir? Calm down. I need, uh, something, uh, festive for a female friend. Species? Twi'lek. Skin tone? Um, teal. How festive, sir? Oh, you know, very. Right this way. We have a selection of Twi'lek wear in the correct color coordinates. Something in hisp silk, perhaps. Sleep gowns? Microgarments? Ratchua followed the droid to the back of the shop. There were no other customers or staff about that he could see. There was a window at the shop's front, and all he wanted was to be sure his back was to it. He paid scant attention to the droid, as it held something filmy and nearly transparent up for his inspection. Yes, yes, that's nice. What else do you have? His mind whirled. He hadn't expected to see anybody he knew here. None of his fellow prisoners were likely to be wandering the station on their own, and what were the chances one of the few guards he had known personally on the prison world would be transferred here? 
apparently much greater than he had expected. When you thought about it, it made sense. They'd need guards on the station, because a place as big as this was becoming would definitely have crime popping up, even if it was no more than deckhands getting drunk and disorderly. And that wouldn't be the only problem. Put a million people into an enclosed space, even one as huge as the Death Star, and there were going to be a fair number of bad eggs. Military discipline wasn't the easiest thing to live under. Plus, there were all those civilian contractors. Yeah, they definitely need detention centers and guards. And who better than guys who had hands-on experience on a planet full of real criminals? Okay, so it was reasonable. But that wasn't the problem, was it? If Steele saw him, he was cooked. No two ways about it. And that was definitely going to put a bend in his ability to court Mima. He couldn't risk going into the cantina if, as he suspected, Rodo and Steele had become pals. It certainly wasn't surprising, given their joint love of hand-to-hand -hand violence. It was inevitable that they'd either be bosom buddies or mortal enemies. Regardless, his potential romance was over before... Hold on, hold on, wait a second. He had told Mima who he was. For maybe the second time in his life, he had offered the truth. She knew he was an escapee, and so far at least, had done nothing. He could just tell her about this. They could work out something. How about this item? He looked at the droid. It held up a piece of crimson silk that he could easily hide in his hand with two fingers left over. The mental image of Mima wearing nothing but this filled his thoughts, momentarily banishing that of Sergeant Steele. Oh, my. I'll take that. And that other thing, too. Very good, sir. Debit code? How about hard currency? That will be fine, sir. Shall I gift wrap these for you? Ah, uh, yes. That would be good. Ratua walked out of the store carrying the packages, in a considerably more sober mood than he'd been in a few minutes before. He had a few nice gifts for Mima, though they might be a bit premature, given the nature of their relationship. He would hold on to them for a while and hope to see her in one, some day soon. And when he thought about it, maybe Steele wasn't so much a threat after all. The man was in the military, so his work schedule had to be somewhere in the ship's computer. Those files could be accessed by somebody with sufficient expertise. And with enough credits, such expertise could be purchased by a careful person. If you knew when and where someone was going to be a large portion of the time, you could avoid accidentally running into him. He felt himself relax a little. Things weren't so bad. Once again, luck had been on his side. He was almost coming to believe that he led a charmed life. 43. Library and Archives, Deck 106, Sector N1, Death Star. Hold still, Percy. I am motionless, sir, the droid said. Atur Wrighton frowned. If that was true, then his hands must be shaking a bit. Was he really that old? Almost done here, he said. A bit more patience. I have infinite patience, sir, being a droid. However, I am constrained to point out that your current actions would seem to be in violation of the Imperial Legal Code, Section 14, Subsection 9, Part C-1, which forbids tampering with autonomous droid function without official permission. So it would seem but I have permission. He inserted the photonic cable and turned it until it locked into place. I show no record of such permission, sir. Hand delivered this morning, Atur said. My eyes only very hush-hush. Really, sir, this is most unusual. I feel I must verify. The droid's last comment was interrupted when Atur touched the transfer button on his data stick, and the program contained therein began to download into Percy's memory. The droid sagged slightly, and its photoreceptors dimmed. The personality substrate would remain the same. Atur did not want to disturb the droid's abilities, good help being so hard to come by. 
there were only two items that would be substantially changed. First, Percy's spyware, which required it to monitor its work environment and to report on any activities that might be remotely illegal according to imperial statutes, would shortly be disabled. Second, its basic loyalty module, set up to put the good of the Empire at the top of its function pyramid as defined by its imperial programmer, was being altered to shift this loyalty to Atur personally. Percy was, in a few more seconds, going to become Atur Raiten's servant, first and foremost, and anything it saw or heard its master do from now on, it would keep to itself. Any tampering with its memory chip in an attempt to bypass the new programming would result in a total memory wipe right down to the primary nodes. What would be left wouldn't be able to walk, talk, or do much of anything else. After all, an assistant who might consciously or unconsciously betray him to imperial agencies, either covert or overt, wasn't of much use. Atur had been able to access some wonderful material over his years of filing and cataloging. This droid-altering program had been one of his best finds. Hook it up, pop it in, and zip. Just like that, you had a new best friend who would do anything to keep you from harm. Anyone who queried Percy would get reasonable assurances that Commander Atur Wrighton was a prince of a fellow, as honest as the galaxy was wide, and this would hold true no matter how insistent the questioner. If it went past a certain point, Percy would suffer a firmware breakdown, and whatever anyone might suspect, there would be nothing to find indicating sedition. The memory of the transfer itself would also be erased from Percy's mind. The droid wouldn't have a clue that any tampering had been done, or that it was any different when it walked out of the office than when it had walked in. There was a ping as the download ended. Atur unlocked and then removed the cable. The entire process had taken only a couple of seconds. He counted to ten. Right on schedule, the droid's photoreceptors lit. Will there be anything else, sir? Percy asked. No, I think that will do it for now. Systems check. The droid replied with no discernible delay. My circuits, modules, and mechanics are all operating at optimum, sir. Well, good, Atur said. He made an airy gesture of dismissal. Toodle off, then. After the droid left, Atur felt better. There was no way he could do many of the things he was accustomed to doing with a blabbermouth droid looking over his shoulder and transmitting it all to the local security computer. The chances of anybody ever grilling Percy until it blew a circuit were very slim. But still, chance favored the better prepared life form. He had a group of new junior librarians coming in for orientation later in the day and tons of things to do before they showed up. His personal files were proof against any of them stumbling across anything secret by accident or intent. He assumed as a matter of course that one or more of them had to be some kind of imperial spy. That was usually the case in any organization, and even if it weren't, it was better to make that assumption and be wrong than to not make it and be thrown into prison for underestimating the powers that were. A man didn't get to be his age and status by being completely foolhardy, even though he had certainly stepped over the line a time or ten. In his lifelong war against authority, he had won more battles than he had lost, even if they didn't know it. Much to do, he reminded himself, and little time in which to do it. Best get moving. 44. Grand Moff Tarkin's Quarters, Executive Level, Death Star Dela stepped from the shower, a waft of hot water vapor following her out, Tarkin smiled as she dried herself with a fluffy black towel made of virgin cotton from the Suliana fields and slipped into a matching robe. She stood under the air jets and dried her short hair, then came into the bedchamber and sat on the foot of the bed. Feel better? Tarkin asked. Much. So much nicer to have hot water than the Sonics. Yes, rank has its privileges. You have news for me? I do. You won't like it. He sat up and looked at her. She went to the desk, opened a drawer, and removed an info disk. She dialed his computer terminal to life. You have my access codes. Now he slid out of the bed, the silk of his sleepwear causing static electricity as it moved across the sheets. His gown crackled and clung to his body, but he ignored it as he walked to where she stood. 
She smiled at him. Of course. Did I give them to you? You don't remember? Well, if you didn't, I know you meant to. Tarkin wasn't sure if he should be angered or aroused by this evidence of Dela's boldness. Before he could decide, a hologram blinked on. It showed rows of sealed cargo containers, the white everplast boxes stacked three deep with corridors between them to allow access. They looked like standard 2.5 meter units, but it was hard to say just by looking. Security cam, she said, aft cargo hold on the undauntable. A security cam that was not destroyed in the explosion. Oh, it was blown up with the rest of the ship, but it was rigged to feed a signal to a receiver. I obtained the recording. How? A moment. Watch. There was a date time stamp in the lower right-hand corner of the image, the seconds flashing by. A figure moved into view. Tarkin frowned. It was still hard to judge size without some kind of scale. As if reading his thoughts, Dela moved her hand over a sensor, and a grid overlaid the image. The figure was slightly less than two meters tall. That still didn't tell him much. With the cloak and hood concealing it, it could have been any of a hundred species. The mysterious being walked along the row of containers. It reached one in the middle of the cam's field and tapped the keypad on the door with one gloved finger. Why didn't we have bioscanners going as well? Tarkin asked, annoyed. We'd have data on species, sex, age. Shh, she said. We were lucky to have gotten this much. Now watch. The door rolled up and the figure entered the container. Thirty seconds passed. The figure emerged, closed the door behind him, or her, and moved out of cam view. Dela waved the recording off. She looked at him, waiting. Tarkin was nobody's fool. The explosive device was in the cargo container and ready to go. All the agent had to do was trigger it. Yes, he didn't bring anything with him, so it had to be in place already. And? She turned to the console's controls. Another image appeared. This one, a routing manifest. The rigged container's ID number is not visible in the recording, but the number of the one eight down is. So it was a simple matter to figure out the one we want. True, Tarkin thought. Loading droids were not known for creativity. They stacked cargo containers by the numbers. You can see that this container came from the cargo vessel Omega Gaila, itself from the ammunition stores at the regional naval supply area near Gaul. The container carried high explosives, so that's what a scan would show, if anybody bothered to do one. She waited again. Tarkin thought about it. The RNSA at Gaul is a high-security facility, extremely tight. Nobody on or off the base without top clearance, even the cargo handlers. Yes. He frowned, shook his head. Not possible. Yet somebody got into a container and rigged it with a bomb powerful enough to blast a star destroyer apart. And they weren't shooting in the dark hoping to hit something, because it took somebody on the other end to arm the device. So they knew where it was bound. He finished for her. No way to have agents at every possible destination. Once it got to our storage facility, it could have gone to any of several ships. Or to this station, she said. It was the luck of the draw that Undauntable needed ammo before we did. So it's being run by somebody higher than a cargo handler. At the very least, there had to be somebody from routing involved, and enough of a conspiracy to be able to place or contact an agent already here. We are talking about a rebel spy in the Imperial Navy with more than a little reach. Just so. We can probably determine who loaded the container and who routed it, which is good but also doesn't stop something similar from happening again if the next shipment comes from a different source. Correct. We need to find whoever is running the agents here, he said. I concur. He looked at her. How do you plan to do this? I'm assuming that the agent did not choose suicide. We have the day and time the device was activated. He or she would have had to arrive before that time and depart before the explosion, Undauntable's operational logs were backed up on the station's computer, the last entry coming just before the ship's destruction. It might take some time, but we can access those and narrow down the possibilities. Good, Tarkin said. 
do so immediately. She smiled and adjusted the lapels of her robe. Immediately? He did not return her smile. Yes, there are times for dalliance and times for action. I want to report by 0500 hours. Dela nodded and began to dress. Quickly. 45. Med Center, Section N1, Death Star. Yule looked at his commander incredulously. Since Hotees had arrived and set up shop on the station, they hadn't seen each other that much, and Yule wasn't happy to be seeing him now. What? Hotees said. You seem to think that I personally run this war, Doctor. Believe me, if I did, it'd be run a sight better. As it is, there are things that are simply in short supply. Medical doctors, not to mention psychiatrists, are hard to come by, even here with the big green light. It won't kill you to step into the breach now and then. You did rotations in both disciplines during your residency. Of course I did. I'm not complaining about the work. But I'm a surgeon, not an internal meds doctor. My skills are rusty outside my specialty. Well, you have state-of-the-art robotics backing you up, as well as the top-of-the-line diagnosters in the galaxy. A first-year medical student or a competent droid could run those and hit the mark 95% of the time. You're making my point for me, doctor. Yuli held his hands up. These are for cutting, not tapping knees and treating headaches. It's not the best use of my talents. Hoti shrugged. Making best use of talent has never been the military's mission, son. They change about as fast as a space slug molts. If they want to have a doctor digging trenches in the field of battle, they will have him do just that, because they can. If routine physicals get in the way of your surgery, then let them slide. But as long as you aren't slicing and gluing... We don't have enough help for you to sit around waiting for another body to open up. He leaned forward, putting his hands on Yuli's cluttered desk. He looked, Yuli thought, about twenty years older than he had months before when he'd assigned Yuli his duties. Yuli could also smell a faint whiff of alcohol on his breath. Eventually, Hotez continued, we'll be fully staffed, but until then we have to spread ourselves around. And if the spread is too thin for the good of the patients? Hotez straightened. Suck it up, Dr. Davini. There is a war on, after all. Yuli sighed and nodded. He hadn't really expected anything else. And tired or not, drunk or not, the man was right. A surgeon lying on a couch could just as easily be treating routine lumps and bumps. Didn't mean he had to like it, though. You have patience to see, Hotez said. So all get out of your air. Have a nice shift. The older man exited the office, and Yuli glared at Hotez's back as he left. I'm unfamiliar with all the nuances of human behavior, C. Formio said, but I think it's safe to say you didn't come out the best in that exchange. You're the second wise mouth droid I've met. If I never meet another one, my life would not suffer a bit. Here's the next patient's chart, doctor. Go find something useful to do before I decide you need to be reprogrammed as a latrine cleaner. We can do that in the military, you know. Take a medical droid and put him to that use. Idle threats do not become you, Dr. Davini. Yuli smiled despite himself and looked at the chart. It described the complaint of one Sergeant Nova Steele, a guard, who was having... bad dreams? Great, wonderful. He knew less about psychological maladies than he did Rhodian influenza. In the exam room, the patient sat on the table wearing a disposable flimsy gown. Offhand, he looked fit and muscular. On the face of it, he didn't appear to be beset with any major psychosis. His affect was calm. Sergeant Steele, I'm Dr. Davini. What seems to be the problem? The man gave him a little shrug and looked embarrassed. Trouble sleeping. I see. Says here you've been having nightmares? Yeah. I hate to waste your time on piddly stuff, Doc, but I'm starting to doze off at work. Maybe you can give me a pill or something. No problem there, we have all kinds of sleeping meds. But we should probably try to figure out the cause before we try curing it. Steele shrugged again. You're the doctor. How long has it been going on? Hard to say. I used to have a bad night once in a while at my last posting, but they've gotten worse since I was transferred up here. More frequent. Uh-huh. 
Any stress at your job? Steele laughed. I'm a guard. I deal with sodders locked in detention who don't want to be there, most of whom did something illegal to get there. Stress goes with the territory. Been doing it a while. Since I joined up. Eleven standard years. Okay. So the stress level now is what? More? Less? The same? A little less, actually. I was posted dirt side before, some real touchy types on despair. Most of them crazier than a rabid Shistavanan. Guys detained here on the station are generally military or civilian contractors who got too frisky or greedy. Not many career criminals. Easier to deal with, because they got more to lose. Okay. Recreation. I do martial arts. Getting hit in the head more than usual? Steele laughed. Other way around. I'm the teacher. I don't get tagged much. Anything new or different so far as diet, alcohol, quarters, relationships? Not that you'd notice. I get along with my unit, eat the same stuff I usually eat, don't spend my time drinking. Basic barracks are the same all over the galaxy. I share a cube with a few other NCOs. They aren't any trouble. I tend to serial monogamy and don't have anybody I'm seeing right now. Subjective analysis seemed normal. Could be an allergy. Lots of construction chaff and microscopic dust floating around before the filters catch it. Let's do a physical, make sure all your systems are online. Run some analyses of blood and urine and stuff like that. Do a mag scan. If we find something we can fix, we'll fix it. If everything checks out, I've got meds that will knock you out like you were hit with a mallet and guarantee a dreamless sleep for six hours. Sounds good. Yuli did a physical exam, which was unremarkable. The man was as fit as he had first thought, at least to the trained eye. He had C4MEO take the patient to the diagnostic array and run the standard battery of tests, covering all the major systems. The machines were fast. The first results started coming in before the second batch of tests began. Things looked unremarkable. Steele was in great shape for a man his age, better than most humans 20 years younger. Myoconduction, brain scan, EEG, MEG, dendrite function were within limits. Afferent, efferent speeds were slightly better than normal. Heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, spleen, pancreas, repro, bowels. Yuli looked at the blood composition readout. Platelets fine, WBC normal spread, hematocrit, hemoglobin, all normal. Except his midichlorian count was over 5,000 per cell. Yuli blinked. That was unusual. Normal human range was less than half that. He didn't know a lot about midichlorians. Nobody did anymore. Most of the research on the subject had been done at the Jedi Academy by their own healers, and their records were not available for study. A shame. The Jedi were all gone. Like Barris. He shook his head. He didn't want to rocket down that particular space lane, thank you. When he'd met Barris, he'd been up for his first tour in the field, young and idealistic. Now Barris was gone. And so was his idealism. This blasted war. He pulled himself back to the task at hand. Could the high midichlorian count be somehow responsible for the sergeant's dreams? If the Jedi were correct, these were the vital living components that connected everything to the Force. And he'd heard that the Force could sometimes cause strange, even prescient, dreams. It seemed to make sense especially given that it was the only anomaly on the tests. So what's the drill, Doc? Yuli explained the stats to him. The sergeant looked blank. Mini-whats? Midi-chlorians. And you think that might be the problem? Frankly, I don't know. Not my specialty. I'll check into it and get back to you. But in any case, it shouldn't be dangerous at your levels. You aren't going to die from it. Steele looked relieved. That's something anyhow. I'll give you some tablets that should allow you to rest. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. Just doing my job, Yuli said. After the sergeant was gone, Yuli accessed the station's medical library. Not surprisingly, there was no more to be had on midichlorians than he already knew. 
Maybe there was a doctor with specialized knowledge of cell biology on the station, or assigned to one of the warships in the area. He started to post a query on the MedNet, but then stopped. Was this a good idea? He asked himself. The Emperor had ordered a complete ban on any and all data having to do with Jedi and the Force. So thorough had been the revisionism that now barely two decades after the Jedi heroism of the Clone Wars, nearly every reference in every data bank in the galaxy had been purged of matters and information relating to the Order. Most beings born since then knew little, if anything, about those larger-than-life characters whose names had once been on everyone's lips, and their elders were smart enough not to talk about the subject. The ban, as far as Yuli knew, was still in effect. Did he really want to put up a query on a public forum concerning such a highly sensitive topic? After all, Sergeant Steele seemed to be in no danger, immediate or long term. He'd never heard of midichlorians being associated with any pathology. Did his oath to heal extend so far as to put himself in harm's way by asking for information on a forbidden topic, especially when the patient seemed to be in no danger? Yes, he reluctantly decided. If there was the slightest chance that the midichlorians were causing or had the potential to cause ill health for Nova Steel, it was Yuli's duty as a healer to pursue all courses of inquiry. C. Formio entered. Your next patient is ready, doctor. As he interviewed the next patient, Yuli realized that while he'd resented Hotiz's laying additional work on him initially, now he was glad of it. It took his mind off what a moral quagmire the galaxy had become. 46. ISD Devastator, Arconis Sector, Outer Rim. Lord Vader? What is it, Lieutenant? The Lieutenant practically stank of fear. Normally that was to be expected and not a problem, for fear was a useful tool, but occasionally it could be time-consuming. You aren't afraid, Vader said, drawing his fingers together to concentrate the Force. I'm not afraid, the Lieutenant echoed. The tightness in his face and body relaxed somewhat. You have something for me? Yes, sir. The lieutenant held up a printout flimsy sheet. One of your warning flags has been tripped. A surgeon on board the battle station has requested from the local mednet information on midichlorians. Very well, leave it here. You may go. Sir. The man left. Weak-minded idiot he still was, but at least he wasn't shaking in his boots. Vader read the new dispatch with interest. He considered the knowledge therein. Why would someone in the battle station be looking for information on midichlorians? Vader knew all about midichlorians, of course. He, personally, had the highest count per cell ever recorded, more than 20,000, more than Yoda, and, he knew, more than his erstwhile master, Kenobi, which meant that potentially he could have a stronger connection to the Force than anyone. Since most, if not all, of the Jedi were no more, that was all the sweeter. Though Vader was convinced that Obi-Wan had remained hidden all these years, as had Yoda, assuming the latter had not finally shuffled off into death. Yoda had been very old, after all, and the defeat and deaths of the Jedi could not have helped him age any easier. He could be dead, but it was unwise to make such assumptions about such a powerful Jedi master. Back to the subject at hand. It might be wise to have a word with this medic and see what he was up to. Midichlorians did not normally figure into the medical treatment of most beings. This was unusual. Not unusual enough to leave his current mission and go investigate, however. Soon enough, he would have reason to return to the battle station. He would deal with this doctor and his strange request when he went. For now, it was time to go again to his hyperbaric chamber to rest and recharge. There was much that needed to be done in the service of his master, and never enough time to do it all. Architectural Offices, Executive Level, Death Star Tila saw the flowers on her desk when she arrived for her shift, a spray of ever-lilies, rojos, blue blossoms, and purple passions, artfully arranged by somebody who knew how to mix and match them for the most visual appeal. 
She could smell the spicy, peppery scent of the rojos wafting in the office air currents as she drew nearer. The card with the arrangement said, So where do we go from here? That, she thought, is a good question. There wasn't any real future for them. He was an Imperial TIE fighter pilot on war duty, and she was a convicted criminal working as a trustee on the biggest battle station ever designed and built. Their backgrounds were too different, their loyalties too far apart. While it was true that they would both go where the Empire told them to go and do what they were ordered to do, Tila did so because there was no real choice, whereas Vil gloried in his work. Construction on the station kept getting faster as the crews learned from the first sections built and were able to build new ones with less wasted effort. Some parts of the process had been so streamlined that the work went nearly twice as fast as it had before. The army of construction droids worked tirelessly, day in and day out. An interior structure that would ordinarily take months to finish with organic labor would often be completed in only a few days. It was amazing, and to an architect, most gratifying to see such constructions appear as if by magic. The only ones who came close to matching the droid speed were the Wookiees. Tila remembered an old saying, give a Wookiee a knife and send him into a forest in the morning, and by evening he would have carved you a table to eat dinner on, and a house to put it in. They were on schedule in many areas, ahead in many more, and behind in only a few. Tila felt mixed emotions at this. After the station was completed, it would go off to engage the rebels and help destroy the insurrection. And Vil would be in the thick of all that. And where would she be? Probably back on the prison planet for the rest of her life. Then again, life was always uncertain. You could get hit by a hover truck crossing a street. There were myriad diseases that would kill you in short order. Somebody could forget to weld a seal, and a decompressive blowout could spit you into cold vacuum where you'd be dead and frozen solid before anybody came to collect you, if they even bothered. You didn't get up every morning expecting such things to happen. That way lay depression as deep as space itself. But you had to know that life was short, and there were no guarantees. So at the moment she had a spray of beautiful flowers on her desk that probably cost a couple of days' pay, and the attention of a not unattractive man who wanted to spend his time and energy with her. Today, tomorrow, a month, a year, nobody knew how long they had. So why not seize the moment and enjoy it as much as possible? Her inner self allowed us how that made sense. Go for it, girl. She moved her hand over her desk's console and lit the comm. After a moment, the hollow came up. Vil smiled at her. Hey, he said. Hey, yourself. The flowers are lovely. Thank you. We still on for dinner tonight? He asked. Yes, but I'm betting I can do a better fogu than any restaurant on board. Why don't you come to my cube and let me cook for you? Part 2. Shakedown 47. Corridors adjacent to detention block AA, level 5, Death Star. Sergeant Steele, we have intruders. There's a breakout on level 5, detention block AA-23. Take a squad and get over there. Nova stared at the lieutenant in disbelief. Intruders? A breakout? How is that possible? Sergeant! No time to wonder about it now. Copy, sir. On our way. Breton, Zach, Dash, Alex, Kai with me, Mal, Cy, Dex, Nate, on point. Move out, people. The squad hustled out of the barracks and into the hall, the sound of their armor rattling as they moved. The corridors were strangely deserted, which Nova chalked up to luck. Fewer people meant fewer civilian casualties. Who are we after, Sarge? That from Dash. Nova didn't know. Who were they after? Well, Carkett, he'd know them if he saw them. Just shoot who I tell you to, he told the trooper. Then he raised his voice to include the rest of the squad. Double time it, people. They ran through the gray and black halls, following the four guards on point, their sidearms held up, fingers outside the trigger guards as per regulations. The ceilings and floors were covered with blaster-proof absorbital, so if somebody accidentally cooked off around, it wouldn't do any damage. If you carried your weapon pointed at the floor, however, 
there was a good chance in a crowd that you'd shoot somebody's foot off, and the walls and vent grates weren't all that sturdy either. The corridor branched ahead. As they approached, Nova was desperately trying to remember which one led to D unit, when a blaster bolt sizzled through a cross corridor ahead. The four guards on point skidded to a stop, then moved ahead slowly toward the intersection to peer around it. Nova suddenly realized this was all familiar. It was as if he had been here before, seen the events that were now unfolding. He knew, without knowing how, that in the next few seconds, a squad of stormtroopers was going to, ah! Somebody beyond the bend in the corridor screamed, and a moment later, half a dozen troopers barreled around the corner of the hallway intersection, heading toward Nova and his men. They were being chased by a single man with a blaster, yelling like a berserker as he ran. The man, Nova saw that he was dressed like a down-on-his-luck spacer, stopped, realizing that there were suddenly overwhelming odds in front of him. Then he turned and ran back the other way, putting on a burst of speed as he disappeared around the corner. After him, go! Nova led the pursuit, followed by his squad and the others. Once around the bend, he saw that the fleeing spacer had been joined by a Wookiee, and both of them were now shooting back at their pursuers as they fled. A blaster bolt took the man next to Nova. He tried to line up on the runners, but was jostled by somebody from behind. His bolt scorched the plating just behind the two escapees. The human zapped another round at them. Time slowed down. The bolt crawled toward them, impossibly slow. But as slowly as it was moving, Nova found he was moving even slower. The deadly energy burst was going to hit him, and there was nothing he could do to stop it. The blaster bolt slammed into him, penetrating the chest plate easily. It pierced his chest, burned out his heart, and he fell dying. Nova jerked up in bed, his pulse racing, as one of his cube mates hollered, Hey, Steel, wake the frip up. You're yelling in your sleep again. Some of us are trying to get some milking rest here. Sorry, Nova gasped. He slowed his breathing, using calming techniques he'd learned over the years. He felt his pulse rate drop, felt himself grow calmer. But not calm enough. Nova laid back down, staring at the ceiling. So much for the sleeping meds helping things. Command Center, Overbridge, Death Star. Tarkin looked at the data running up the screen, pleased. The station was nearly operational, at least enough so that they could begin basic maneuvers. The super laser was only partially functional, true, but it was hot enough to test, and he had some ideas about how to do that. All in all, things were going very well indeed. There had been a few glitches. Dela had not been able to find those responsible for the destruction of the Undauntable. She had returned to the Maw, but would be back again soon. Tarkin looked forward to her next visit. An intelligence report had just come to his attention. There had been some kind of break-in and theft at an out-of-the-way military base on Danuta. While normally this would have been of little interest to Tarkin, the investigating agents had heard some intel, no more than rumor, really, that one of the files stolen was a set of plans for this battle station. Tarkin frowned. On the face of it, that seemed unlikely. How would the plans have gotten to that back rocket planet in the first place? Then again, military secrets were notoriously hard to keep, and a file could be transmitted across the entire galaxy, given enough power in the generating signal. Some low-level functionary might have at some point come across the plans and decided to copy a set. There could be many reasons for doing so. Knowledge was power. How much would the plans be worth to the Rebel Alliance? A fortune, certainly. Well worth the small risk of being found out. And if there was even a remote chance that such a thing had come to pass, if those plans had fallen into the clutches of the rebels, that could be bad. The station, when fully operational, would be invulnerable from without, of course, but a saboteur who knew exactly where to do the most damage from within could be a real threat. This needed to be addressed, and Tarkin knew who was best suited for the task. It was galling to have to ask the man for help, but the station's safety was paramount. He moved to the hollow plate and activated it. It was a priority one communication, and the connection was made almost immediately. The shimmering image of Darth Vader appeared before Tarkin, 
life-sized, as if he were standing in the same room. Grand Moff Tarkin, why have you called? I understand there is a remote possibility that a set of plans for this battle station may have been stolen by Alliance agents. Yes. Tarkin clamped his teeth tight enough to make his jaw muscles ache. You knew this? I have my own agents. The black helmet had no way to change expression, of course, but Tarkin could hear the amusement in the Dark Lord's voice. I see, he said, his tone carefully neutral. Now is not the time to be at odds with the Emperor's lackey. I will find out if it is true, and if so, I will deal with it. The black helmet inclined questioningly. That is why you called me, isn't it? Tarkin nodded. Vader might be many things, but faint-hearted he was not. Once he began a task, he seldom swerved from finishing it. Odds were that the story was no more than a baseless rumor. But if not, no one was better equipped to determine the facts and eliminate the problem than Darth Vader. A useful, if dangerous, tool. No matter how Tarkin might feel about him personally. Keep me advised, he said. Of course. The image of Vader vanished. ISD Devastator, near Toprawa, Kalamith Sector, North Quadrant. Vader broke the comm connection with Tarkin. How had the man found out about the stolen plans so quickly? There must be a leak somewhere. There were always leaks. The only way to prevent them was to keep everything to yourself, and that was not always possible. Vader, of course, knew much more about the situation than he had told Tarkin. It was true. A set of plans had been stolen from a military base, and those plans were, indeed, now in rebel hands. They had been smuggled to Darknell and then to Toprawa. There, a band of rebels had seized an Imperial communications tower and transmitted the plans to a blockade runner orbiting the planet. The blockade runner, he had learned, was the Tantivy IV, Princess Leia Organa's vessel. Bail Organa and his daughter had been among those in the reconstituted Imperial Senate who had cast their lot with the rebels. The proof was not there yet, but Vader knew. He did not even need the Force to assure him of this. He knew it. Doubtless, her ship was on its way to deliver those plans to some secret rebel base. Vader had to find and capture the craft before it arrived at its destination. Even though he would have preferred to follow the vessel to its destination and destroy the base, the destruction of another nest of rebels was not as important as safeguarding his master's prized battle station. Thus, the Devastator was bound for Tatooine, where his agents had predicted the Tantivy IV was headed. A secret base there made little sense, as the planet was mostly desert and of little military or commercial value. The world was far enough out of the main lanes so that the rebels might have had a base there once, but that possibility had already been checked thoroughly by Imperial operatives, who had reported that no such place now existed. It made little sense. The planet was all sand and dunes, sparsely populated by colonists, both humans and other species, and the indigenous Tuscans. Vader knew just how inhospitable the place was. After all, he had spent his early years there. No. Anakin Skywalker had been raised in the hot, dry wasteland. But who he was now had been forged on a world that made Tatooine look like Hoth. He had been annealed in the molten rivers of Mustafar. Mustafar was his birth world, not Tatooine. In any event, why the princess was going there was unimportant. Perhaps she was just taking a roundabout route to throw off possible pursuit. What was important was that she had the plans for the Death Star, and that in itself was sufficient reason to detain her. The Empire would recover the plans, and in so doing rid itself of her meddlesome actions at the same time. His master would be pleased with both events. 48. Super Laser Fire Control, Theta Sector, Death Star. They hadn't lied. The differences between the simulator and the real thing were negligible. There were more worn spots and scratches in the simulator, put there over months of drills. But the equipment was identical. Despite all the training, Ten was still a little nervous. 
This was the real thing. From here, they could generate a pulse of pure destruction that was stronger than anything ever fired before. Amazing. And not a little intimidating. Not that he expected to ever fire the weapon at full power. Certainly not to destroy an entire planet. The whole idea, as he understood it, was that the threat would be more than enough. They'd probably disintegrate an uninhabited moon or two, just to prove they meant business. But the actual targets would be military, rebel bases, fleets, and the like. For such as those, the super laser would be a ridiculous amount of overkill, akin to frying a green flea with a turbo laser. You've been hands-on in the simulator, you've seen the reeds, so I'm not breaking any big news here, his CO said, breaking Ten's reverie. This is a monster gun, but it's not a repeater. You miss the first shot, you won't get another one on your shift. Ten nodded. He'd asked about power storage first day on the simulator, and the engineers had fallen all over themselves backing away from that one. But once he'd seen the numbers, they had to keep those honest, even in sims. He'd figured it out pretty quick. The capacitors could hold enough juice to light up a planet, true enough. But once they discharged, they weren't going to be filling back up real quick. Once you shot the thing, you might as well turn off the lights and go take a long nap, because it wasn't going to be back up to full power for the better part of a day. True, you could still pump out some pretty nasty low-power beams, and the definition of low here was still bigger than what a Star Destroyer could manage, even letting all the hardware spit at once. But it would be a duster instead of a buster. You could scorch a city or two, boil away a large lake, or perhaps even a small sea. But that was about it. And if you were the guy pulling the trigger and you missed, well, you'd be looking for a new job starting ten seconds after you said, Oops. Ten said, My crew doesn't miss, Cap. You find a target, and if we can see it, we will hit it, my personal guarantee. The CO laughed. You shooters are all alike. Check the records, Cap, check the records. They don't pay me to miss. The CO's face went serious. I know that, Chief. But we don't get to pick the targets. It might get ugly. Ten shrugged. I'm not a politician or a moth, sir. I do my job, let them do theirs. The CO slapped him on the shoulder. Good man. He sounded relieved. So we going to get operational here? Pretty quick, son. Let your crew get familiar with the knobs. It's all supposed to be the same, but we won't be shooting blanks. I don't want anybody to get the jeeblies when it comes time to crank it up for real. I hear that, Cap. My crew won't let you down. I know they won't, Chief. That's why they get the first shot. You retire and have the great grandkids at your feet, you can tell them that, how you shot the first round from the biggest cannon ever made. Something to look forward to, Ten said. That is, soon as I get a wife and get started on the kids who will get that great grandkid ball rolling. Both men laughed. The Hard Heart Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. I still find that a pretty bizarre coincidence, Mima said, that out of all the cantinas in all the galaxy, the one guard who would know you on sight happens to walk into mine. Stranger things have happened, Ratua said. I knew a farmer on a legume co-op on Duro, one of 50 workers there. He was drafted into the Navy. So he went through a year of basic training, shipped out, wound up being sent halfway across the galaxy to patrol in the middle of nowhere. He got liberty on a planet called Pazab. He walked into a Gamorian pub, sat down, ordered an ale. Guy came out of the fresher and sat on the stool next to him, turned out to be a shift mate back on the farm. Nine zillion clicks away from home. They both just happened to be in the same pub at the same time. What are the odds on that? She shrugged. Got me, math was never my strength. You don't seem to have much of a problem counting your credits. She smiled. Okay, so he was a bad boy, but he did make her laugh. That was worth a lot these days. Speaking of the worthy sergeant, he said, looking at his chrono. I'd better take off. Steele's duty shift is over in a few minutes, and if he drops around to have a brew with Roto, I want to be elsewhere. Good idea. Dinner when you get off? My place? As long as you promise not to cook. You wound me, woman. Better than poisoning you, like you nearly did me. How was I to know your kind can't eat sweet weed? You could have looked it up. You plan to date outside your species. It's on you to know what's poison and what's not. You're never going to let me forget it, are you? 
Not a chance, green eyes. I'll pick up something on the way. Seafood, shellfish, like that. They smiled at each other. He put out his hand, she took it in her own, and they exchanged gentle squeezes. She could have done worse, Mima knew. She had done worse. More than once. After he was gone, she sighed and stretched, feeling tense muscles loosen. There were only a handful of customers in the place. It was just before shift change, and people were either on their way to work or about to get off. So it would be another hour or so before the cantina started to fill up. Time to take a break. Business had generally been very good, better than she'd expected. As the station grew, new sections being added and pressurized, there had been new cantinas added regularly as well. There were at least half a dozen of them in this sector alone, and scores of watering holes throughout the other completed portions. But she hadn't noticed that the competition had hurt her any. True, she was getting only a small percentage of the profits, but even so, at the current rate, when her hitch was up, she'd have enough saved to start a new place of her own. She wasn't sure she wanted to do that, however. Chances were good they'd offer her an extension on her contract, and she needed to think seriously about that when it happened. True, it was the military, so there were some rules a little stiffer than on a civilian planet, but even so, it was clean, the patrons were generally well-behaved, and she was making money like a jewel thief on a luxury space liner. She didn't miss the great outdoors, she'd never been much of a nature girl, dirt side, and she'd only ventured out of the southern underground a few times. Not that there was much outside there, all of Imperial Center being essentially one large urban area, save for a few parks here and there. A cantina on an impregnable battle station, or one next to the space docks and the slums of Imperial Center. Put that way, it didn't seem too hard a choice. Certainly this one was a lot safer than any she'd ever run before. Nobody was going to set it on fire by accident, and from what she'd heard, no rebel ship could scratch the paint, much less really damage it. Staying on was definitely something to consider. She was having a pretty good time, all things considered. And green eyes being around didn't hurt much either. Mima smiled and hummed a tune as she began to mix more drinks. 49. 200 kilometers off Sector N4, Equator, Death Star. Ville slewed into a drifting turn to port, engines and pressers working hard to compensate for the slide, and his pursuer, one of the newbies in Beta 2, wasn't quick enough to stay on his tail. He jinked again, this time to starboard, and again the newbie was a hair slow to react. Understandable. This wasn't a move they taught in basic flight school. It was one you learned from somebody with a lot more cockpit time than the instructors had to waste on trainees. The newbie said something excited that Vil didn't quite catch, but prayer or a curse, it didn't help him. Vil had reversed their positions, finishing the loop lined up on the newbie's rear. Gotcha, kid. Vil thumbed the firing control and painted the newbie's backside with the scoring lasers. If his guns had been at full power, the kid would be dodging debris now, and both of them knew it. No big, kid, he said over the comm. We all gotta slide down the learning curve. Attention, all squadrons, attention. Break off your drill immediately. I say again, break off all maneuvers immediately. Arm your laser cannons to combat mode, defensive pattern, prime, and stand by. What the cark? The order was completely out of the black, but Vil was too well trained to question it. He swerved away and toggled his op-chan to his squad's frequency. Alpha-1 on me, pyramid formation, green and blue, one, one, two. He punched the control button, and the signal diodes on his fighter began flashing in the sequence he'd given them, so that his squad would know his fighter and get to their positions. Green, one count, green, one count, blue, two counts. Then repeated, dit, dit, da, dit, dit, da. What's up, loot? That was Aniel, of course. How should I know? Stow the chatter and listen. The other pilots quickly assembled and moved into the pattern. It was the most basic of fighter maneuvers, practiced hundreds of times, and it didn't take more than a few seconds for all twelve to line up properly. Vil switched to the main operations report-in channel. Alpha-1 is ready. Other squads logged on. There were ten of them out there, 120 fighters in all. After a moment, command channel took over. 
All units, this is Grand Morph Tarkin. We have detected an enemy carrier shifting into real space from light speed in Sector 7 at 2,200 kilometers distance from the station. Repeat, enemy carrier in Sector 7. The vessel is identified as the Fortressa, a Luca Hulk class carrier. Star destroyers are moving to engage, but we expect the enemy to launch fighters. They pose a risk to the station. Stop them. The local op Chan Sig flashed, then overrode the main. All fighters, all squadrons, this is Flight Commander Drolin, DS-11. We are deploying in Zone Defense Delta. I say again, ZD Delta. We are about to get our feet wet, boys, and I'm buying for the pilot who shoots the most of the fatherless scum out of the vac. Vil's mind was a whirl. Luker Hulk class vessels were originally Trade Federation ships, mostly modified commercial freighters. They were huge circular craft the biggest, 3,000 meters in length. After the Clone Wars, some of them had fallen under rebel control. Unless the Alliance had done some major refitting, they weren't heavily armed, nor were they well shielded compared with the Star Destroyer, but they could carry a lot of fighters. Originally, they'd spaced vulture droids, but the rebels would have no doubt switched to X-Wings. There might be a thousand of them in that ship, maybe more. Vil swallowed, his throat suddenly dry. This was it. The real thing, a full-scale engagement, and his squad was going to be among the first ones to arrive at the party. It was both exciting and terrifying. This was what all the training had been for, not some police action on a back rocket planet, but an actual battle with rebel pilots, some of whom were vets who had flown TIE ships before they defected. This wouldn't be like shooting targets on a range or painting newbies with low-powered beams. This was do or die. This was why Vildance had signed on. Now it was time to see who had the right stuff and who didn't. Command Center, Overbridge, Death Star. Our first wave of TIE fighters will arrive on Zone Station momentarily, sir. We have scrambled an additional thousand craft from the station. Admiral Motti didn't seem disturbed, but then he didn't have the primary responsibility. Tarkin did, and he was most aware of that as he looked at the hologram shimmering over the operations theater projection. He wasn't really surprised, however. He had halfway expected something like this for weeks, ever since they had lost the undauntable to sabotage. The rebels, some faction of them at least, knew they were here, else they would not have been able to blow the ship up. Strategically, it made sense to attack the station now before it was fully finished and operational. Tactically, a carrier was the smartest way. It would cost much, if not most, of the entire rebel fleet to get past the Star Destroyers posted here in order to engage the battle station directly. But out of a thousand fighters or more, some might get by the TIE squads and inflict damage, even if the mothership was taken out. Maybe not enough to destroy it, but if they could slow construction, that would be a victory of sorts. The lieutenant running the sensor array said, Sir, the first wave of enemy fighters has left the carrier. 250 X-Wings. As Tarkin nodded, the Comtech said, Sir, I have a coded message incoming on your personal channel. Tarkin blinked. Who could that be? Put it on my personal screen. Their TIE fighters were holding at a thousand clicks out, and it would take a few minutes for the X-Wings to get that close to the station. The Star Destroyers were en route. There was nothing more to be done at the moment. Tarkin activated the message. Dela's face appeared on his screen. He tried not to let his surprise show. Admiral? Grand Moff Tarkin, we're en route to the station, and it seems there is some interesting activity out there. Nothing we can't handle, he said, though you might want to circle around and avoid it. By it? You mean that enemy carrier and all those X-Wings pouring out of it? Yes, that area is about to become inhospitable. You're sending in star destroyers? I was, but as of this moment, I have a better idea. Ah, precisely. Well, I'll move away from... Blast! Dela, we have company. Disconnect. She broke the connection, and Tarkin frowned. Dela was an excellent commander, and her ship was fast and well-armed. She could deal with a few X-Wings, Still, 
Sir, the enemy has disgorged a second wave that makes 500 fighters, the sensor technician said. We'll put a stop to that. To Mati, he said. Admiral, have the Star Destroyers stand down. Break off their intercept. Sir? Mati looked at him as if he had just turned into a purple-dyed Wookiee. Tarkin smiled. He moved his hand over his comm. Super laser control, came the response. Motti's expression changed. Now he smiled, too. Commander, Tarkin said to the comm, I have a target for you. Super laser fire control, Theta Sector, Death Star. The CO said, You heard the man, Chief. Can you do it? Sir, no problem. 2,209 kilometers. Not an easy target. If we have the power to reach that far, I will hit it, sir, Ten replied. The CO checked a readout. We have 4% in the discharge capacitors. More than we need, Ten said. The CO looked relieved. Go, Chief. Ten nodded, turned to the console, and opened the speakers. We have an order to commence primary ignition, he said to the crew. All right, boys, let's pull the hammer back and cock this solder. Report. The various sections reported each operation's status quickly and enthusiastically. Hypermatter reactor level 125th of maximum. Capacitors 4% available. Tributaries 1 through 8 green for feed. Primary power amplifier green. Firing field amp is green. We are go on induction hyperphase generator feed. Tributary beam shaft fields aligned. Tributary beam shafts 1 through 8 clear. Targeting field generator ready. We have primary beam focusing magnet at 10 sixteenths Gauss, now 14 sixteenths, now at full. 10 scanned his board. All green. 28 seconds. Not their fastest time, but not bad. We're good to go, he told the CO. The CO nodded and said to the comm, Grand Moff, super laser is primed. The Grand Moff's voice over the comm was calm but crisp. Then fire. The CO nodded at Ten. As he had hundreds of times in simulated practice, Ten thumbed the safety button on the shifter above his head and pulled the lever down. He counted silently. Four, three, two, one. We have successful primary ignition, the computer's voice said. Ten waited. The target was 2,000 clicks away, so the time would be only a hit, the targeting tech said. There was a pause as he scanned his scopes. Well, Ten asked tensely. It, it's gone, Chief, nothing left. Ten blinked at the report. He looked at the CO, who looked just as dumbfounded. They had vaporized a carrier three kilometers across, with 4% power on the beam. Just like that. A cheer went up from the men in the room. The CO thumped Ten's back. Ten grinned in response. But inside, he was still having trouble believing it. 4%. The total destructive potential was nothing short of astronomical. The power of a star at his command. 50. Command Center, Overbridge, Death Star. Well, Mati said, it appears that the super laser works. Tarkin smiled. So it does. But there are still 500 enemy fighters out there, and they have no place to go, so they have nothing to lose. And we already have them outnumbered more than two to one, with Thai pilots itching to shoot them down and plenty more where they came from, Mati said. It's a cleanup operation now, Governor. They can't run and they can't hide. Tarkin nodded. Give the order, he said. Tell our fighters to hit them hard and fast while they're still reeling from what they just saw. Sir, your private channel again? Tarkin nodded and took the call. The man who appeared before him seemed upset. After a moment... Tarkin recognized the man as Dela's ship runner. Yes, Captain Kameda. 
We were attacked by a squadron of X-Wing fighters, sir. We destroyed them, but we took damaging fire. Why isn't Admiral Dela telling me this herself? Sir, we lost shielding on the bridge. There was an explosion. Admiral Dela was injured. Tarkin felt his belly clutch tightly. How bad? Not life-threatening, sir. The medics have stabilized her. Tarkin let out the breath he was holding. But she sustained a head wound and is disoriented. There is a piece of shrapnel in her skull. We need a surgeon. Tarkin nodded. Get her to the station immediately. We're on our way, sir. Should be arriving in a few minutes. Tarkin broke the call, then activated the station intercom. Captain Hoti is answered. N1 Med Center. Admiral Dela has been injured in the attack and is on the way in with a head wound. Have your best team of surgeons standing by. Yes, sir. Tarkin sundered the connection. This was not good news. It mitigated his triumph at the success of the super laser's first firing. He did not want to lose Dela. That would sour the taste of victory. And, of course, he did care for her. A thousand kilometers off the Death Star. The first wave of X-Wings outnumbered the line of TIE fighters two to one, but they were flying non-evasive, hoping, Vil guessed, to blow right past the defenders. That wasn't going to happen. Vil targeted the first X-Wing to get within range, fired, and blew it apart. Just like that. The enemy pilot never got a pulse off. With zone defense, you moved around, but you held a certain position within specified limits. The X-Wings were trying to get past, not engage. They shot if a tie was right in front of them to clear a path, but they didn't deviate from their trajectories. They were intent on the Death Star. That made them easy targets. What kind of lunatic strategy was that? Vil quickly took out a second ship, then a third. Behind him, the battle station had scrambled more TIE ships, and behind the X-Wings, the Star Destroyers were sending out even more. Very soon the odds would be even, if not in the Empire's favor. The flight commander's voice crackled in his ears. Alpha-1, Beta-1, Gamma-1, Delta-1, break zone and pursue, targets of opportunity. Drolin intended for his units to collect as many of the kills as possible, Vil knew. The next wave would stop any who got past. But folks late to the game weren't going to have anything to shoot at when they got here. Vil shrugged. If the rebels were intent on suicide, then his men would be glad to oblige them. He blipped his squad. Alpha-1, you heard the man. Fan out and take him apart. Ten-click global pattern. Don't get too far away. He heard the chorus of, copy, lieutenant, as he pulled his tie around and started chasing the X-Wings. It wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. The X-Wings were so intent on hitting the station that they didn't fight back. The 80 or so that Vil's wave couldn't collect were cut to pieces by the next wave of ties coming from the Death Star. The second wave of X-Wings didn't get a single fighter past the Star Destroyer's tie squadrons. When it was done, Vil had 10 kills, duly recorded by his nose cam and logged into his file. Five kills made you an ace. Just like that, Lieutenant Dance had become a double ace, as had more than a few others. The total number of TIE fighters lost was fewer than a hundred. It had been his first real battle against the rebels, but Vil took no pride in it. It had been easy. Far too easy. 51. Command Center, Overbridge, Death Star. Sir, Motti said. You heard me, Admiral. We are moving the station. The rebels knew where to find us, and I won't allow that to happen again. Tarkin had that look on his face that brooked no argument. It was a look that Motti knew well. Nevertheless, it was his duty to point out impediments. Sir, we aren't really ready for full light speed maneuvers yet. The Grand Moff looked impatient. I know, Admiral. We don't need to go far. The other side of despair will do for now. The rebels will know that their attempt failed, so they won't try the same tactic again. No one but the commanders of the Star Destroyers and their chief navigators are to be given the new coordinates, and aside from you and our chief navigator and myself, no one else on this station is to be given that information either. There are spies among us, Admiral, and while we will eventually hunt them down and remove them, I will not risk this station in the meantime. Understand. 
Yes, sir, I do. Within the hour, Motti. Leave two Star Destroyers here. By your command, sir. Tarkin turned away. I'm going to medical. Admiral Daler's surgery is in progress. After Tarkin was gone, Motti considered his task. It made sense to move, there was no questioning that. If a rebel armada showed up and there was nobody there, well, it was a big galaxy. They wouldn't know where to start looking, and it likely wouldn't occur to any of them that their enemies had gone to all the trouble of powering up, just to lumber around to the other side of the planet. Every additional hour it took for them to locate the Death Star would be one more hour closer to it becoming fully operational. And once that happened, the entire rebel fleet would be powerless to stop it. That the Grand Moff's paramour was injured was too bad, but hardly any of Motti's concern. He held little respect for her as an officer. Without Tarkin's patronage, she would never have risen to her rank. As far as he was concerned, women didn't have what it took to command. If she died on the operating table, Motti would shed no real tears, though he would, of course, pretend sadness to keep Tarkin mollified. The old man was a bit touchy about her, and it wasn't a good idea to get on his bad side. Dela was a distraction. Tarkin cared for her too much. That was another chink in the Grand Moff's armor. A chink that someday Motti might want to exploit. Surgical Suite 1, Med Center, Death Star. Yuli was not a neurosurgeon by specialty, but he had learned a great deal about the subject by necessity in operating theaters all over the war-torn galaxy. He'd lost count of the number of hands-on neurosurgical procedures he had done, and he couldn't even begin to estimate the number of species he had operated upon. If you were the only surgeon available, you cut what needed to be cut. He was not the primary on this case, only one of the three-person team of surgeons digging into the admiral's head. The stakes, as they were keenly aware, were very high. She was the only woman admiral in the Imperial Navy, and she was, according to the scut, Grand Moff Tarkin's very personal friend. It was not beyond possibility that if she didn't make it through the procedure, the Grand Moff might have them all shoved through the nearest lock into unforgiving space. There were seven more surgical assistants in the room, three nurses and four droids. So far the operation was going well. All vital signs were good. Okay, we are removing the artifact now. That was from Abu Banu, the station's only real neurosurgeon. He was a Syrian, one of the few non-human species in any position of authority aboard the Death Star, no doubt because he was one of the best brain surgeons in the galaxy. Stand by the press or field in case we get a bleeder, Banu said. Yuli, who was running the field, nodded, but he didn't need to be reminded. They all knew their jobs. Banu was talking for the recorder that was taking it all down. On a high-profile procedure like this, if something happened, somebody would get blamed and the recording would help pin it down. Sometimes patients died who should have lived. But you didn't want to be the man held responsible for allowing the Grand Moff's lover to expire. No pressure. A small blood vessel began to ooze, and Yuli dialed the presser field up a hair, enough to stop the seepage, but not enough to put too much pressure on the naked brain upon which they were working. Sponge, Banu said. One of the droids extended a rock-steady arm and blotted the tiny bit of blood that the presser hadn't stopped. Roa, dab a little glue on that arteriole. Dr. Roa reached in with the applicator's ultrafine tip and touched the torn vessel. A tiny bead of orthostat solution welled, flowed into the cut, and sealed it. Got it, Roa said. Banu straightened, and Yuli heard his spine crack. No surprise there. Syrians were notorious for back trouble. It was the price paid for those huge craniums they carried around. Okay, crew, what do we think here? Banu asked. Yuli? The shrapnel went into the hippocampus and adjacent cortex, mostly dentate gyrus. Not much in the cornu ammonis fields or the subiculum, but even so I'd guess she's going to have some memory problems. Old ones, maybe making new ones. Dr. Roa. I'm with Davini. Stick a piece of jagged hot metal into CA1, CA2, and CA3, wiggle it around, and you've got definite declarative memory loss. Can't tell how much or how bad. Banu nodded. I concur, 
given the injury, I don't see any problems with general cognitive function, but expressive and factual material will likely be compromised. Anybody see anything else we need to fix? Nobody did. All right, let's close her up. Yuli was degowning in the post-op changing room with the other two surgeons and the assistants when Grand Moff Tarkin strode in. Yuli's first thought was, he's not supposed to be here? But who was going to tell him that? Doctors, what is Admiral Dela's condition? Yuli and Roa looked at Banu. He was the head of the team, so it fell to him to explain it. Sir, the Syrian said, Admiral Dela sustained a neurological injury that chiefly impacted her right medial temporal lobe. She's in good condition and stable. What long-term damage will there be to her? We can't be sure yet. That portion of the brain is called the hippocampus. Humans have two hippocampi, one on each side. This area is in large measure responsible for functions of memory. Tarkin looked impatient. Yes. And? Banu looked at Yuli and Roa, then back at Tarkin. It's all conjecture at this point, sir. She is in a medically induced coma so that we may treat her properly to prevent swelling of her injured brain. When she wakes up and recovers, the chances are good that there will be no loss of function, either neurologically or physically. However, there will likely be some memory loss. Some. How much is some? Banu shook his head. We are not fortune tellers, Governor. We won't know until the Admiral recovers consciousness and can be tested. Tarkin's face clouded, and Banu apparently saw it. The Syrian hurriedly added, If I had to guess, I'd say she won't remember the traumatic event, and that she'll likely lose at least some of the past year. I see. Well, keep me informed. Admiral Dela is a valuable officer. Of course. Tarkin turned and left. A valuable officer, Roa said. He chuckled. I heard that she can ease up on that, Yuli said. Don't know who's listening. That sobered all three of them, and with good reason, Yuli knew. You didn't want to be making jokes about the Grand Moff's girlfriend and have it get back to him. Not if you didn't want to wind up with your organs harvested. Corridor, Overbridge, Death Star As he headed back to the command center, Tarkin was both relieved and worried. He felt great affection for Dela, to be sure, and he was most pleased that she would survive. That she might not recall her most recent visits here and their enjoyable time together was regrettable but considering the possibility that her injury could well have killed her, not so bad. It was not so good, though, that whatever she had learned during her investigation of the spies in their midst would also likely be gone. Since she had never been here officially, there would not be any files tucked away where that data might be found. She was too smart for that. And it was not in the least bit good that she was here and injured since she was supposed to be at the mall. That would have to be addressed. As he walked, Tarkin considered his options. He needed to manage this in a way that would not come back to haunt him. He had not gotten to where he was by pretending politics did not exist. He had enemies, and they would glory in anything that might present him in a bad light to the Emperor. Dela would recover swiftly. She was young and strong. As soon as she was sufficiently well to travel, he would have her transferred back to the mall. A story would be put in place. An accident there had caused her some injury. She would go along with that, since her coming to see him would look as bad for her as it did for him. Travel logs could be adjusted, and there wouldn't be any official record that she had ever been here, much less wounded in an action against the rebels. And if she didn't remember it, well, not to be hard-hearted, but perhaps that was for the best. Even a truth scan couldn't find a contradiction if the person undergoing it didn't know it had happened. Regrettable, yes, but one had to make the best of bad situations, and by so doing, keep them from getting worse. He could fill her in later, once the war was over and things had settled down. For now, he did not need anybody looking at him askance, not this close to having the station completed and about to begin its mission. That simply would not do. His decision made, he felt better. 
Dela would not blame him in the least. She would do as much were she in his place. Tarkin was sure of that. 52. ISD Devastator, off planet Tatooine, Arcanus Sector, Wild Space. Lord Vader, the blockade runner is in range. Should we open fire? Yes, but do not destroy her. Target the drives and control systems. I want the passengers and crew alive. Once we have disabled them, we will capture and board the ship. Yes, my lord. The captain returned to his business, and Vader moved to stand in front of the forward viewpoints to watch the fleeing vessel. It was critical that he prevent the plans for the battle station from falling into the rebels' clutches. And while he was at it, he would find out where they were being taken. Princess Leia Organa was at the core of this operation, and she would divulge what he needed to know. Of that he had no doubt. Her mind might be resistant to persuasion by the Force, but there were other ways. The rebel ship was no match for Vader's destroyer either in speed or firepower. In a matter of moments, the drives and control had been crippled by laser strikes of surgical accuracy. Their main reactor shut down, and a tractor beam from the Devastator generated to envelop the fleeing blockade runner. The Tanta V4 was drawn inexorably into the destroyer's main cargo hold, gripped tightly in a presser field that would jam any attempts by the rebel crew to blow up the captured ship. Vader doubted they were that desperate, but he wasn't going to take the chance. An assault commander arrived. Lord Vader, we have entry teams breaching the ship locks. Good. Vader turned away from the viewport. Come with me, he told the commander. The Tantivy IV rested in the middle of the huge hold, looking small and defenseless, her white exterior marred by the scorched and blackened areas on the engines. Vader, followed by several stormtroopers, strode up the ramp to the airlock. The lock's hatch had been shattered moments before, clouds of vaporized sealant, paint, and metal still hung in the air. He stepped through the smoke into the corridor and surveyed the damage. The bodies of both rebel defenders and stormtroopers littered the deck of the blockade runner. Vader paused to look at one of the rebels crumpled at his feet, then at a second. They had been brave. Foolish, since there was no escape and no chance of victory. But brave. Little good it would do them. The sounds of blaster fire still echoed throughout the small ship. Now and then a stray bolt was deflected from a bulkhead and across a cross corridor, the flash of red reflecting fleetingly off the white walls. Vader was not worried about stray fire. He could concentrate the force enough to stop a blaster's beam with the upraised palm of his gloved hand if it came to that. The conclusion was foregone. The rebels could not possibly win against such overwhelming odds, and they had to know that. Why fight on? There was some purpose to their continued resistance. Of that he was sure. What was it? Vader and his escort moved through the ship's corridors, continuing his inspection. Some of the rebel fighters had been captured, although most had gone down firing. Enough of this. Vader stopped, and, with a gesture to the commander, indicated that they bring him a rebel officer who had just been captured. In another moment, the man stood before him, still under guard. Without preamble, Vader reached out and grabbed the officer by the throat, easily lifting him clear off the floor. He gasped and struggled, but in vain, of course. None could escape the grip of the Force. Before Vader could speak, a stormtrooper approached. He said, The Death Star plans are not in the main computer. Where are those transmissions you intercepted? Vader asked him. What have you done with those plans? The officer struggled. We intercepted no transmissions, he croaked. Vader tightened his grip on the man's throat, lifting him higher. The officer's half-strangled words could barely be understood. Ah, uh, this is a, a consular ship. We are on a diplomatic mission. Vader was not impressed by this pathetic attempt at deception. If this is a consular ship, where is the ambassador? It was a rhetorical question. The man was not going to be helpful, so no more time needed to be wasted on him. Vader crushed his throat and tossed him across the corridor. The body bounced off the bulkhead and sprawled on the deck. He could sense the reactions of the other nearby prisoners without having to look. 
another object lesson. Thwart Lord Vader, and such would be your reward as well. He turned to the assault leader. Commander, tear this ship apart until you've found those plans, and bring me the passengers. I want them alive. Vader smiled under his helmet as a file of stormtroopers arrived with Leia Organa in tow. It was reported that she had shot a trooper before they stunned her. It was hard to think of her showing such bravery. She was so young, so beautiful, dressed in that simple white gown. She reminded him very much of... No, he would not allow that thought. She glared at him, managing to look disdainful even though her hands were cuffed. Darth Vader, she said, making no effort to hide her contempt. Only you could be so bold. The Imperial Senate will not sit still for this. When they hear you've attacked a diplomatic, he cut her off. Don't act so surprised, Your Highness. You weren't on any mercy mission this time. Several transmissions were beamed to the ship by rebel spies. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. She kept to her role. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. Vader's patience was abruptly at an end. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. He gestured furiously at the guards. Take her away. After she was hustled off, Vader stood motionless, quelling his rage. Anger could be useful, but only when it was anger you brought forth on your own, shaped to your ends, not when it was provoked by someone else. He was somewhat surprised by the intensity of his response. There was something about her he could not quite put a finger on, something unusual. It troubled him. Organa's mind was not weak, this he could tell even after a cursory attempt to probe it, and there was something oddly familiar about her, something just outside his grasp. He mentally shrugged it off. It was not important. She would be dead soon in any event. Tarkin had signed the order already. It was only a matter of how much useful information they could pry from her before that came to pass. She was part of the past. He had the future with which he must deal. He began to walk as he considered his next move. Next to him, the commander said, Holding her is dangerous. If word gets out, it could generate sympathy for the rebellion in the Senate. Vader wasn't moved by such fears. I have traced the rebel spies to her. Now she is my only link to finding their secret base. She'll die before she'll tell you anything. Leave that to me. Send a distress signal, then inform the Senate that all aboard were killed. Another Imperial officer approached them. Lord Vader, the battle station plans are not aboard this ship and no transmissions were made. Vader stared at the officer. His anger started to burn again. The officer seemed to sense this. Hurriedly, he added, an escape pod was jettisoned during the fighting, but no life forms were aboard. Ah, so that was why they had continued to resist, to give their precious princess time to physically remove the plans. Of course. He turned to the commander. She must have hidden the plans in the escape pod. Send a detachment down to retrieve them. See to it personally, Commander. There'll be no one to stop us this time. Yes, sir. Vader strode through the lock and back into his ship's cargo bay. At the least, they had prevented the princess from delivering the Death Star plans to the rebels. Imperial troopers would recover them. And even if they did not, there was little damage they could do on the worthless desert world of Tatooine. There was nothing of value on that world. Nothing at all. 53. The Hard Heart Cantina, Deck 69, Death Star. Behind the bar, the liquor bottles rattled on their shelves, and Mima felt a gentle but insistent thrum under her feet. What? she began. We're moving, Roto said. Next to him, Nova said, Sublight engines so we aren't going far. The customers, about a quarter capacity this time of cycle, paused for a few seconds, then went back to what they were doing. Nobody seemed too perturbed by the event. Why are we moving? Construction isn't finished yet, she said. Is it? Apparently enough so that the ship can be relocated, Rodo said. 
After a moment, the vibration evened out. The bottle stopped jittering. The hum quieted and became very faint, barely felt. Mima turned to Nova. What does this mean, Sarge? He laughed. Oh, right, me being so critical to the running of the station, the moth called me up and gave me a personal briefing just a minute ago on my comm link. Didn't you notice? Rodo said, I don't believe I'm giving away any military secrets when I say it probably has to do with the battle we just fought. She looked at him. What battle? End of Star Wars Death Star Part 2 of 3 Restored and remastered by The Archivist Publishing <laughs>